Thank you and welcome members, welcome. Welcome members of the public to this special remote overview and scrutiny committee of the Environment Committee. This meeting has been convened to hear the call in of the subject of the Hoylick Beach Management. Um, item number one on the agenda is um, apologies for absence. I have Councillor Leslie Rennie uh, deputising for her is Tony Cox. I have Councillor Andrew Hodson deputising for him is Councillor Jenny Johnson and uh, other apologies received to Councillor Sarah Sproul deputising for her is Councillor Agent Jones. I now invite members to declare any interests or party whipping arrangements. Are there any? No, okay. Can we do a roll call of members please to see who is... Chair, Chair, sorry. Uh, declaration of interest, I'm a member of um, Cheshire Wildlife and RSPB. Thank you, Councillor Musbrook. Um, I've got a hand up from Councillor Irene Williams. Yeah. I'm trying to unmute. You are unmute. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the RSPB and Cheshire Wildlife Trust as well. Thank you. Okay. Any members have any more? Declarations of interest? No. Can I remind members once you've spoken to um, mute and mute their microphone and turn off the camera, but also put their hand down as well? That'd be helpful. Um, if you go to Vicky Shaw now to do the roll call of members, please. Good afternoon, members. If I call your names out, if you could uh, turn your camera on and uh, identify that you're present, please. Councillor Muspratt. I think you're on mute, Councillor Muspratt. Both cancelled, but I'm going to have a Sorry. Sorry, I can't unmute and turn the camera on, but yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Cotier. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Councillor Collins. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Councillor Davis. Yes, I'm here. Thank you Thank very much. Councillor Greeny. Yes, I'm yes. present. Good afternoon. Councillor Kenny. Yes, present. Thank you. Councillor Cox. Hi, Vicky, yeah, here. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Councillor Adrian Jones. Oh, sorry. sorry, Chair, can I just say, I, I spoke to Councillor Adrian Jones just a minute or so before four o'clock. He advised me then he was having problems connecting. So he's trying, so... Um, hopefully he'll be with us in the next couple of minutes or so but that was just before four o'clock he said he was having a problem thank okay. you councillor kenny I'll, I'll try him again at the end of the roll yeah. call. thank you thanks councillor williams yes i'm present councillor cameron i think councillor cameron's just having problems with sound she's gone out and trying to come back in again. Okay. okay. Councillor Johnson. Yes, I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Bray. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes, I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Good afternoon. I'm present. Thank you. Do other Councillor Jones has been able to join us yet? Yes, I'm here now. Thank you, Councillor Jones. <laughs> Councillor Cameron, do you have any sound yet? I think she's just put in the chat there's still no sound. Uh, what do we do in this situation? Should we wait? I think she needs to turn off and start again. 
That's what I had to do. JS. Okay, she's just messaged me to say she's doing a full restart. Um, do we pause for a couple of minutes, Vicky, or do we carry on? Um, I think a full restart may take a little time, but I mean, maybe if you want to outline the procedure that we're yeah. going to follow this afternoon to people. Okay, well, thank you to um, our witnesses who have joined us as well. Um, this decision was called in on the 13th of March to pause the vegetative beach management works at Hoy Lake Beach. And it's been called into this Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee in accordance with Standing Order 35 of the Council's Constitution. Um, it's important to note at this stage that we have a petition that's been received on the 22nd of July 2020 in relation to the management of Hoy Lake, Hoy Lake Beach with uh, 1,470 signatures that were collected in November and December of 2019. Um, this petition has been formally submitted to the next Ordinary Council meeting on the 19th of October, and it will be discussed there. I believe um, the lead petitioner is um, a, a witness as well, which um, can be referenced in, in their statement. Um, so just so everyone's aware to take note of that petition. What I'm going to do is just set out the procedure for everybody. So the lead calling signature is Councillor Andrew Gardner. He will be given time, five, oh, five minutes, um, to outline his reasons for the calling. Members will then have questions, opportunities to ask questions of Councillor Gardner. I will then turn to the decision maker, um, the Cabinet Member for Environment and Climate Change, Councillor Liz Gray, to explain her reasons for the decision she made. I will then I invite members to ask questions of Councillor Gray. I will then move to the evidence from the calling witnesses that Councillor Gardner has called. And that is, um, first person will be Miss Nicola Bacady. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Apologies if I haven't. Then it'll be Mr David Gilbertson. And then it'll be Mr Charles Warren. And after each one of those witnesses has spoken, I will invite members to ask questions. I will then move to the evidence from the decision takers witnesses, Councillor Grays. And that is Dr Alan Janet of Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service. Um, David Parker, uh, the chair of DSG Conservative Group, Conservation Group, apologies. Um, and Mrs. Judy Uguna, uh, apologies, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And then Mr. Rich Adiman. Um, then I will ask uh, Councillor Gardner to summarise um, his case. I'll then ask Councillor Gray to summarise her case and then invite the members of the committee to uh, for debate and invite comments. Um, we've got a witness, Mr. David Gilbertson. Can you just please mute your microphone and switch your camera off at the present time? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, can, can you mute your microphone as well, please, Mr. Gilbertson? Do we have Councillor Cameron back? She's just said that she's doing a, it's doing an office update. Okay, can someone just text her to see if she can dial in on a phone? Um, if she's got the Teams app, it might be quicker. Uh, Chair, I'll see if I can dial her into the meeting. Thank you. Vicky, do I still wait now or do I carry on? Um, I think it's a matter for you to decide, Chair, whether you feel that we can wait any longer or whether we need to proceed. Um, I will give it one more minute and then we will proceed. Hi, Tom, I think I've resolved the tech situation. Excellent. Great to have you back. OK, so I will move to um, Councillor Gardner then to outline his reason for the calling. Councillor Gardner. That's great. Thank you, Chair. Can you all hear and, hear and see me? Just check the text working. I can hear you. Yes, we can hear and see you now. So, um, yeah, the beach, uh, I think I've learned so much about beaches in the last three years of um, 
work in Hoy Lake. Um, it's a very, very complex uh, issue. There's so many variables uh, in it. And therein really lies the, the, the difficulty in making good decisions around, around the beach. So the cabinet decision from this year really ratified um, a decision made last year to um, halt um, vegetative management. Now, we're all aware of the, the uh, glyphosate debate, and that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is the raking uh, of the beach and the beach area. And I think my the main reason to very important to call this in is that the beach being what it is being a dynamic uh, natural area um, we don't know what it might hold in the future we don't know what happens if we stop raking it we don't know where that is going to go so what i really don't want to happen is that we end up in a situation where by default we end up in a, a, a predetermined or a prejudicial um area for the beach where we reach a point where there's no going back and that is really the the, the problem if i may chair can i just share a screen um it might just help with with members if i may you may yeah okay so everybody see that so the first thing i'd like to mention is and i think this has universal um approval to do something with is the drain situation on North Parade. North Parade, um, the road North Parade and the, uh, the promenade all drains on to the beach. So when we get um, rain, everything drains on there, all the, uh, the tire rubber, brake dust, fumes, petrol, lollipop sticks, you name it, all goes down the drain, all ends up on the beach. Um, that's an area there that you, you can see. The drains were blown out a couple of weeks back and that's what came out of the drains. So that's just the concentration, but that shows quite clearly um, the level of, of toxicity that comes out of the drains. Um, and this will require significant uh, investment from the council to um, to remediate and, and stop that issue from happening. It is mentioned in the Natural England report as well. And I think we can all agree that we need a way forward on that. Uh, I took this the other day and I just want to make sure that we all know what we're talking about because Hoy Lake Beach, the area that we're concerned about and the raking takes place, takes place from just about here by the lifeboat station in a line um, up to uh, Red Rocks. So it's approximately an 80 metre uh, distance out all the way down to Red Rocks. Here again, back in the, the heyday probably. Uh, 40s, 50s, I don't know. Crucial, if you can look at the sand level here to the wall and you look at the intertidal area here, here's the uh, intertidal area, here is the beach. Again, sitting in that 80 metre line. Um, I haven't put this in for nostalgia. I've put it in to show that this is maybe 100 years ago. I think that's a horse-drawn cart or something there. But the beach level there was up to the wall. Probably windblown sand, but that's what we what we get today still. So there's no real nothing new about this this sand accretion argument, and I wanted to raise that because the sand accretion is there's there's a lot of um, I'll say I wouldn't say misinformation. There's a lot of selective information cut out about sand accretion. Um, what we can see here is the actual truth of the matter. This is. Uh, document from last year from the council, an 18 year period, and I'll take you through it because it's probably a little hard to read. The red area here by the new lifeboat station, which I think was built in 2008, um, has increased over half a metre, as has this area here, very slight, small area here. For most of the beach, it's between 0.10 and 0.5 metres of a rise or sand accretion, as they call it. The yellow areas, yeah, it's pretty much the same, isn't it? Uh, 0.0 to 0.10. The green areas and the blue areas are actually places where the sand has the sand level has dropped. So I just wanted to make that clear to members because you will hear throughout the debate tonight about sand accretion, and I don't think the the science and I think the data is is hugely conclusive on that. Um, and I think it's something that we can manage. Still, I don't think it's reached a point where we can't manage it. And if you reference back to the previous photos, you will see there that um, 
it's nothing new. It's it's what happens on the beach, and it, and it comes and goes with winds and tides, hugely dynamic, and it can change by the day. Just so everybody knows what we're talking about, uh, this is Hoyle Lake Beach here. This is Hoyle Bank. This is the SSI area. This is the North Wirral foreshore, which just goes around to the tip there uh, by New Brighton. Um, and this area is the bit that's referenced to in the latest Natural England uh, document. The document refers to the whole of the North Middle Foreshore and it occasionally references uh, Hoy Lake Beach. This is an extract from the existing site management agreement for uh, Hoy Lake Beach with Natural England, 2010, extended in 2016, I think. So you can quite clearly see the dark area here from the lifeboat station down to Red Rocks. This area here is the raked area. It's not the full 50 acre site of the of the beach. It is the 40 acre site and the intertidal zone was where we formally sprayed um, the Spartina. As I say, we're not talking about spraying today in any way, shape or form. What we are talking about is raking this area and this area alone. Well, if we can just pick up on there, members will take a moment just to read that paragraph at the top um, and I will read the last sentence for you. Regular raking will inhibit vegetation growth and provide an area of open intertidal foreshore important for some bird species. And the key point, again, we don't know what we're doing by stopping raking. This beach is 125 years old, it's always been managed. The wildlife that is there has grown up around that management. We don't really know the impacts of stopping that management, what it would have on the bird species. Um, and I think our claim today really is to carry on with beach management until we reach a really good decision about where we go in the future with the beach, rather than um, a, a reach a, an outcome that can't be reversed or an outcome that might be, be damaging to, to wildlife. Uh, much is made of Natural England in this debate. This is the last Natural England um, uh, official uh, report on the beach. And you can see that it was um, unfavourable and declining. The 2004 report was favourable. And with Natural England reports, um, there's no prizes for second place. They're either favourable or varying stages of, of unfavourable down to uh, destroyed, I think they say. But what can be seen quite clearly here is they haven't done a formal assessment since 2012. So I'll unshare that now, I think. I think it's this one. Um, so that's where we're at. That's our take on things. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. That was uh, very helpful to see that visually. Do members have any questions for Councillor Gardner? Okay, I'll go in the order I see them. So first I've got Councillor Tony Cox, then Chris Cook, then Christina Musbrat. So Councillor Cox. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you'll be unsurprised to hear I've got quite a few questions for all participants this evening. And I'll try not to um, um, hog the entire meeting. So uh, perhaps I can do them in a couple of stages, but we'll start with a very simple one uh, through you, Chair. Councillor Gardner, like, so the, much has been made of the National England Report, um, which we should have all read by now. I've read it on four occasions now. And at no point can I find anywhere in the National England Report that says we cannot rate this speech. So have you managed to find anything that does say uh, to the contrary to what I'm saying? Um, thank you, Councillor Cox. Uh, no, I haven't. I don't think the report says we can't rake the beach. I think it, um, it advises we, we assess. But of course, you know, we have an existing beach management agreement, which we should honour until next year. And then we will have done our assessment and then we will know where we stand. And just a, a, as a follow up to that, so have officers effectively already um, started enacting Councillor Gavay's cabinet decision because we stopped raking the beach? I don't think it's been raked for two years now, which is obviously having um undesired effects in our, our our opinion so um and if that has been the case that they've uh, chosen to start doing it before before the cabinet uh, decision was ratified 
Um, how has that played out with local residents? Or to be more specific, your polling, which has been questioned, uh, I might add, by the cabinet member for validity, um, which uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm included in that, and I do take that as a personal slight. Um, would this be a close thing in Hoyley? Uh, or more specifically, what percentage were in favour of seeing the beach raked? Uh, and what were in favour of, in inverted commas, a natural process? Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cox. Um, yeah, if we go back a year, um, I wasn't aware that the beach was raked in the year before. Um, the beach clearly needed a rake uh, this time last year, and we were asking for that. And it's my belief, and this meeting should, you know, uh, prove this, that officers were content to, to rake the beach. Indeed, I met officers on the beach back in March 2019. I met Anthony Bestwick, Bestwick and Christine Smith. And we ran through issues on the beach. We were aware of uh, the glyphosate issues and we, we agreed that we probably need an enhanced raking program and they were content to do that. Um, a machine was being purchased um, and that wasn't an issue to those two officers who obviously are the officers on the ground um, to do that. Um, we couldn't get it raked. Uh, I believe uh, the cabinet member stopped officers from, from raking the beach. Um, you can ask her that question when she comes on for questions. And of course, by the end of September, uh, we can't rake anyway. So then we're into not being able to rake till next April. As regards um, local people, I mean, I think, and you, you've asked the question, but you know the answer as well as I do. There is not a day goes by where we do not get resident contact about this. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it, it is incredible. There is, I'm not saying there's not two sides to it. I'm not saying there aren't people who are for um, naturalizing the beach. Clearly there are. And do you know what? If they were the majority, I'd say, okay, you know, let, let's, let's, let's back that if that's what people want. However, it is clear to me that that is not the case. We did our own polling back in 2018 as part of our uh, political campaigning. And it, it always amazes me how people see suspicion in this because it's not suspicious at all. It's what we do. We sent out over two different mailings, two and a half thousand surveys to people at Holly Lake and Mells. We got a really good response rate, somewhere in the region of 20 to 25%. There's a range of questions in there. It wasn't uber, uber political. It was us trying to find out what the people of Hoylake and Mells wanted and garner opinion. And it was a binary question on the, the beach. It was, do you want to see uh, a sandy beach or do you want to see um, let the grass grow? It was really as simple as that. There's no mystery to it. There's no, um, you know, there's no chicanery. There's no sleight of hand. And those responses were over 90% um, in favour of retaining uh, a sandy beach. And I think really everyone knows we campaign on this, we support residents on this. It's a key message for us. It's a key message in all our literature. And I would point, if you want another example of, um, of the way Hoylake and Mills feels about this, if you take Councillor Wright's election of last year, if you added the Labour vote, and you put it on top of the Green vote, and you put it on top of the Liberal Democrat vote, and you put the Independent vote in there, and you put, I don't think there was a UKIP, but if there was one, you could put that on as well. Councillor Wright would still have won the election last year. Councillor Wright enjoyed a very, very substantial majority on this campaign. And I'm sorry if some people don't like that um, in the town hall, but that's a fact. Okay, can I... Jake, can I, could, would it be possible just to have one more and then I'll uh, bow out? Yeah, briefly, please, and briefer answers if we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Gardner, just um, this is with regards to meeting in, with Natural England. So is it reasonable to say that colleagues, war colleagues, elected, democratically elected war colleagues for Hoylake were excluded from meeting with Natural England when the cabinet member did meet with them, uh, officers met with them. Uh, we clearly don't know exactly what went on in those discussions because we were not privy uh, to them. Um, and do you think that has helped transparency uh, of this process? Do you think the process um, uh, uh, is something that the people of Hoylake are satisfied with? Or do you believe that it's actually damaged all faith uh, in current uh, democratic process within uh, Whittle Council? 
Um, yes, we, we we were aware of the Natural England visit, um, and officers advised that it wasn't appropriate for us to um, to engage with Natural England at that point, and it would be officer led. And certainly the officers didn't want political involvement. And I think that was quite quite clear in conversations that you and I had with them at the time. Um, does it help with transparency? Absolutely not. Um, does it create a trust issue? Yes, certainly it does. But that's, you know, that's that's for the people of Hoylake to to decide. Thank you. Just just on that, as this to remind members, as this is a call in, um, officers aren't um, witnesses as such so they can't come in to um speak at the moment but i will allow officers since they've been named to come in if they if, if they wanted to at, at the well at the end point um i have got councillor cook councillor musbrat councillor johnson and um, councillor collins um i'll take them in that order if, that, if everyone else can then put down their hands i won't, won't forget you i'll go to councillor cook now thank you Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, Councillor Gardner, yes. Sir. Well, my question is, it's about the survey that you conducted where you say over 90% of respondents, uh, in answer to the binary question, would you like to see a pristine sandy beach, you know, uh, said yes. Um, that strikes me as something of a disingenuous question, really. Um, and I'm just wondering if, as part of the survey, you made any attempt to inform the residents that you surveyed uh, of the complexity of the nature you know of the whole beach management process you know and that uh, i mean i've had a case recently in my ward where um um one particular business polled residents about opening a new business and claimed that 60 odd percent were in mm. favor but they didn't mention uh, that in the process of, of developing this business, it would sacrifice two existing ones. And as soon as we made that clear, the tables were turned, you know, so the answers are totally different. So well, when people need the full implications. So, so basically my question is, uh, you know, w w was there anything to try to inform residents about the complexity of the nature of the um, beach management? Well, I think to, just to be clear, the question was, there was two boxes to tick. You could tick a box to let the beach, the grass grow, Mm -hmm. or you could tick a box for a sandy beach so mm -hmm. it was people had a choice you know it, it, when i say binary yes it was yes or no but you had a choice on two questions to say yes mm -hmm. or no so it wasn't it, and i know people find it, I, it I, there's no chicanery in it that's the way okay. it was if you're from hoy lake um you know about the beach and you know about the issues Everybody has an opinion on it. Um, I appreciate people just around the corner in West Kirby, Greasby, um, Oxton, wouldn't have any appreciation of it. I would say the vast majority of Hoylake people, because uh, it's, it's about lifeboats, it's about the sailing club, it's about all the activities they've always done on the beach. Um, their parents could have could have been in, you know, in, in the lifeboats uh, uh, organisations and all the support that goes around that and the fantastic job that they do. Hoylake is very proud of those traditions. Hoylake is a seaside town. People understand the issues. So back at that point, it also wasn't the hot potato it was today. We were literally. Um, asking the opinions of, of the residents. So it wasn't the question that should be asked now in a consultation where we have um, options coming forward. It was literally, what is your opinion? What is your wish? Is that, is that clear? Does that answer your questions? Fair enough, yeah. Um, I do have a second question, if that's all right. Is uh, Councillor Cox answered us three. It's a brief one, really. Uh, again, twice it's been mentioned, there's a lot to be made of uh, Natural England, uh, you are aware that um, on the 12th of August, a letter was received by Councillor Gray, Cabinet Member for the Environment, uh, quite clearly stating that um, the position of Natural England has changed over the years uh, since he sent of about four years ago, uh, and that they're they're definitely more in favour now. You know, taking a a more cautionary approach to well obviously the glyphosate you say isn't discussed today uh, but also that they're moving towards changing its position and they would now focus more on natural coastal dynamics and vegetation succession so basically they're now 
you know, on, on, on balance, all things being equal, uh, that, that they favour, you know, uh, less uh, beach management. Yeah. I, I read that only an hour ago because that's when mm. I was. Yes. Um, but what I would say is that it refers to the intertidal zones. The beach raking is not the intertidal zone. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Musprat. Go on, Christine, we can hear you. See you. You can't hear me. Yes, we can. We can. Why can you? Because it's showing the microphone's still off. Um, I want to take you back to, if I may, Councillor Gardner, and thank you, Chair. Um, because we've come here for a call in and you've you've written down the call in and in it you've said that there's been no consultation um and um it, this is ideological i think was one of the phrases used mm -hmm. and the decision is um irreversible but as i read the council minute um the the cabinet minute it said it was asking that this whole um discussion goes out for consultation including the lifeboat association okay. and all interested parties and therefore by calling it in you seem to have actually stopped the process and stopped a consultation which i may well be wrong but it, it seems to me that that's what's happened yeah. And when you say, hang on a second, can I finish, please? And when you say that it's irreversible, how can a consultation be irreversible? Because it is a consultation, and that's what's being asked for. So, quite honestly, I'm quite at a loss. I didn't think we were coming here today to discuss whether we rake the beach or not. I thought we were coming here today to discuss your calling, which doesn't mention that. You're calling mention, you called in a cabinet decision, which was to go out and consult. So can you explain to me why we're talking about the next process when we haven't consulted? Because I think the residents of Hoylake um, deserve a consultation, but you seem to have preempted their consultation a little bit by deciding what's going to happen. I might be wrong. The, the issue is, Councillor Nusbratt, is that what the Cabinet decision seeks to do, which is pause vegetative um, regulation on the beach or control on the beach, is already in, a, in, a, in action. That is already happening. There is no vegetation control on the beach right now. We're allowed to do it because we have it in here. In the 2010 beach management, we're allowed to do it, but we are not doing it. And that is the basis of the, of the call-in. Now, I've got no problem with a consultation. I, I welcome a consultation, to be honest. I think that would be a fantastic idea. However, the issue is, what's gone on here is, is a little bit back to front. We've had, uh, we've had a notion, then we had action, then we had officer work, then we had a cabinet decision before we've had a consultation. Now, if we'd gone to consultation and carried on the beach management agreement, we wouldn't be in call in today. But the Sorry. problem is, the problem is, beach management has already stopped. So can I just um, unpick that a little bit? Because as I understood it from David Armstrong um, at an environment meeting, we were told the reason why the beach hadn't been raked was because the wrong kind of equipment had been bought and therefore it couldn't go ahead. And that previous to that, the equipment that they had got had been broken and there'd been a long wait for equipment. And as this was March, um, by calling it in when you did, you would have stopped any raking anyway. So I, I really I, I really am at a loss to understand what it is you're actually yeah. expecting us to understand here. You ask for consultation, but you stop the consultation. You talk about irreversible situations about a consultation because that's what it is about whether the beach has been raked or not 
we have we've discussed that in the environment committee and we were told categorically by david armstrong that that was the reason now nikki's here i understand perhaps she will be able to explain later why david told us that if you're saying that that's not the case which i find a bit difficult to understand and i think we need some clarity on that but i don't and i qu quite honestly don't understand why you don't want it to go out to consultation because clearly you don't because you called it in which you knew very well would stop consultation I think if you if you look back at the history, the beach has been had one partial rake in two years. That is the problem. Now, the council's woes as regards their equipment, uh, sorry, doesn't really wash. They do have a brand new machine there. It can be made to work if they wish to make it to work. Um, if there's various inadequacies, inadequacies in that, you know, I, I'm not here to 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 pull off a system account on that. As far as consultation goes, I welcome consultation. This was called in March. This meeting should have been five months ago. Should it not? Well, so, so, so we would have been in a position where we could have had the consult. But the issue is that it's called because of. We want the consultation to be before the cabinet decision is ratified. I'm sorry, the cabinet decision is to go for consultation. That's what the cabinet decision was. So I still don't understand well, yeah. exactly why you are saying you want to call in a decision for consultation because you want consultation. Because. And I'm also concerned that you're saying about this this raking because I feel quite strongly that it, it, if the Environment Committee were misled, then then what you're implying is a very serious thing. And I have never known, in the 30 odd years I've known David Armstrong, I've never known him to mislead no, you once. We're just going along the language here of misleading. I don't think that is the case, Christina. This is a call in. Um, it's not a regular scrutiny committee meeting and they're not down as witnesses. So officer references without having them chance to come in is, is a bit unfair. Um, I'm going to give Andrew a, a chance to respond again. I think we've had these questions and answers. Uh, uh, sorry, to, Chair, no, I'm not no, happy no. with the answer. That's why I keep asking. Right. And I, will, right. I will bow to everybody no. else who wants to ask questions. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm going to give Councillor Garner the opportunity to respond to the question. You could just put the last question and then I think we'll move on from this question. Okay, uh, Councillor Muspratt, I am very happy that you've asked this question because what you are asking for is the implementation of this, which is the 2010 beach agreement, beach management agreement, which says we can rake the beach. We can rake the beach tomorrow if we wish. And the people of Hoylake would very much like that. That doesn't affect any consultation. We welcome consultation. Is that clear? Okay, thank you, Councillor Gardner. I've got Councillor Jenny Johnson next, then it's Councillor Collins, then Councillor Kenny, then Councillor Brain. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. This is quite a simple question, really. Um, why has beach raking stopped? Um, and is there any other immun amenity space within Hoylake? Because at the end of the day, other areas such as West Kirby does have amenity space, but that's the place where people you know, walk their dogs, they play with their children, with their families. It's a really fantastic area for our locality. And those of us that have grown up in Wirral would, I'm sure, um, say that it's a wonderful, wonderful space. So it's really important that we look after that. But by not raking this beach, which we're not doing currently, we are letting this go effectively long term, maybe to a salt marsh or something like that. So why are we not raking the beach is my current question. Um, and do you think as local councillors you're listened to? So I represent West Kirby and Thurston Ward, as you know. And so we have six um, councillors across our, our beach area there in that locality. Are we being listened to and are you being listened to as Hoylake um, Mel's councillors? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I think your question as to why the beach isn't being raked now, you need to maybe ask the Cabinet member um, when you have a, your opportunity to talk to her. Um, there was an equipment problem, um, but that, you know, that didn't stop anybody last year from hiring a tractor or doing, you know, doing the right work around making the equipment um, effective. 
As regards amenity space in Hoylake, this is really, I'm glad you asked that question, it's a really key point because there is very little other amenity area in Hoylake and there's 5,000 people in Hoylake and they would be reduced if we if we lost the beach, if the beach became um, an area that, that couldn't have, you know, proper exercise on, um, you reduce to basically a kid's park with with half of a uh, five-a-side football pitch in. Um, there is, the way the Victorians built it is they built it with the beach to be the amenity space. That's the whole purpose of it. And they got the position inch perfect, absolutely spot on. So uh, the beach is Hoylake's amenity space. And how are we being listened to? Well, well we've, we've, we've had this conversation for month upon month upon month upon month. Um, and it's been very difficult, increasingly fraught and fractious. And, you know, um, it would have been much easier to have you know, proper dialogue, um, you know, last year. But there are constraints around around the uh, the beach and what we can do. But nevertheless, yeah, I, th I think you're right. Uh, board members have not been particularly um, uh, particularly well well listened to on this. Thank you, Councillor Garner. I've now got Councillor Mike Collins. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks uh, for your uh, input there, Andrew. Uh, just uh, basically two questions, really. Just to be clear, the part of the beach that requires uh, raking is how deep and how long? Uh, that's question one. And at the se same time is, can you explain, you, you mentioned the word intertidal and the area that's being raked are different. Can you explain that? Because I'm getting a bit confused. Right, OK. So Hoylake Beach is 50 acres, two kilometres long. Work that around and it means it's 100 metres deep. And that is Hoylake, the amenity beach of Hoylake. And we only have license to rake on part of that amenity beach, so it's the first 80 metres. And the idea of that is that we that rake is that raking does not go into the intertidal area. The intertidal area is the mean low water to the mean high water. Um, I hope I got that right. An expert later might correct me on that. Um, and that is the wetland area with the birds and the wildlife and the um, crustaceans and everything else um, um, functions. So when we look at what well, the raking element, that's above that. That's in another area. It's a higher area of the beach. So there isn't the wildlife there. There isn't the wildlife that depends on it. It, it isn't... Um, or you see the webs reports and things, that area is, is not affected, doesn't affect greatly um, any of the wildlife. It's the amenity beach area. Does that answer, is that clear? Yeah, yeah thanks for that. Um, it's just a, a say, what, so you've just said that, what harm will be done if we rake the beach at that area? So is there any harm going to be done if we are raking that beach? Uh, I, I can't see what the harm would be, um, and I, I haven't read anything in any of the reports that particularly cites harm that can happen in that area. We're not proposing going out into the tidal zone, into tidal zone, and pulling tractors over it. That is not what raking of the beach is. Raking of the beach is is the amenity beach, not the waders, not 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 the wildlife and stuff. That amenity of the first 80 metres. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I've now got uh, Councillor Brian Kenny. Yes. It, it, thank you, Chair. Through you, it, can I ask Councillor Gardner, when you began your statement this afternoon, you appeared to accept that the whole question of the Hoylake Beach management was a difficult and complex issue. Uh -huh. But Later on, I think you confirmed that you had two questions that you went out uh, to residents as part of your consultation, which was basically the first question, would they be happy to let the grass grow on the beach? And the second question, would they basically like a nice sandy beach? Well, do you not accept that by posing the two questions in that way, 
it was a gross sim oversimplification of the whole issue. And are you really surprised or can anybody be surprised at the answer you got in that in the fact that you've put the questions that way? Is it not like going to people and asking them, do they want motherhood and apple pie? So do you not accept that posing the questions in that way did not really alert the residents to the difficult issues surrounding this whole question? Uh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Brian and Councillor Kenny. Um, I think you, that was done two years ago. It was, if it was done today, it would be a standalone consultation document. It was part of a series of, of questions. It was part of a series, I forget how many, it could have been eight or nine, I think. So, as I said before, the people of Hoylake understand the beach issues. The people of Hoylake know the beach better than anybody. They really do. They, most of them are growing up on it. And it was a question to find out where people sat with their opinion on it, because there is a, a body of opinion, and we accept it as legitimate, that we quite happily see the beach naturalise. Okay, so if that had come back as a significant um, body, then you know, we'd take that on board. The amount that came back was overwhelming. That is what people want to see. Our post bag reflects that, not universally, but I would say things tend things tend to follow the same ratio about one uh, nine one way one another. And I would point to, as I said before, Councillor Wright's majority. You know, if you put the Labour votes, the Liberal Democrat votes, the Green votes, all the others. Councillor Wright would still win, and that is a backing for the policies that we put forward, and it's a little thing called democracy. You know, democratically elected on that policy. So regardless of, of, of what we've said then, which was quite a simple question, just, just you know, finding opinion, which I think is a legitimate thing to do, um, we have the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating of that, and even now, our post bag uh, backs that up. Is, is it complicated? Yes, it is. Which is all the more reason why we shouldn't go jeopardising it by doing actions that are different to what we have done. The wildlife on the beach has grown up around that beach management. How do we know by stopping that beach management we're not damaging that wildlife? Councillor Kenny, have you got any more questions? Well, just, just to come back, uh, please chair i don't necessarily accept that twice referring to the local election results last time round is justification for what you're trying to do in the calling different people in elections have different reasons why they vote for one uh, candidate and another but all i'm saying is i think to oversimplify it in the way you've done in these questions should not lead anybody to be surprised by the outcome i'll leave it at that chair Thank you. I think that was more of a statement than a qu question. So I'll, I'll move on to the next one, just conscious of time. Uh, I've got Councillor Brame, then Councillor Cottier, then Councillor Adrian Jones. Councillor Brame. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'd like, I've got two questions, really. The first one is about the renewed advice from uh, Natural England. Um, Councillor Gardner said that the, the, this advice uh, simply refers or refers to the intertidal area. Um, well, that is partly true, but the section about the intertidal area simply talks about the use of herbicide. Um, so it's only it's only that part that it's referring to. Um, on the second uh, second point um, is. A bit of clarity about what you're asking for. You, you a moment ago, you brandished the, the the management plan for the beach and said you wanted to see that implemented. Uh, well, of course, the management plan for the beach actually says we can use herbicide and we can do raking. But at the beginning, you said you don't want to pursue the herbicide options, so you don't want to implement the management plan as it stands. Uh, we need a bit of clarity, I think, uh, Councillor Garden, exactly what you are asking for. Thank you, Councillor Brain. Um, I, I think when the experts come on, we might get some clarification 
tidal zones, etc. What we are asking for with the existing beach management agreement, which the council still has with Natural England, it is still valid, is to perform the raking actions that are allowed within it. It's been the council's gift to um, perform the beach management agreement or not. What we are asking for is they perform the section of it that allows us to rake the amenity beach. That's it. So does that does that clarify the position for you, Councillor Brain? Yep. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. If, before we move on, I just wanted to mention the about the letter came from Natural England that we all saw an hour ago. And it's a shame that um, I do know Councillor Gray wanted um, to have somebody from Natural England to answer questions. But I'm just going to ask our legal officer what weight members can give to this letter, bearing in mind that we can't question the contents of that, that letter. Um, are you okay to do that, Vicky? Yes, um, obviously it's a matter for members to consider what weight they should give to the evidence uh, in light of the fact that they're not able to question the author of the letter. Okay, I think that was clear. Thank you. Okay, just wanted to get that in there. Um, Councillor Cottier, then Councillor Jones, and I see Councillor Cox wants to come in again. So, Councillor Cottier. Okay, thank okay, you, thank Chair. You, Chair. Um, um, sorry, I'm sorry, going to be back, which is really determined. Um, right, this beach management, um, Councillor Gardner, that, the plan that you keep um, showing, that's 2010. Mm -hmm. um, we've since uh, declared a climate emergency uh, on the Whittle, which was democratically voted for in the Chamber. Mm -hmm. um, and having said that, you know, okay, you're saying that the beach management plan is still valid. Um, you've also mentioned that you would like enhanced raking, and there's a machine that's capable of doing enhanced raking. You don't want to use the herbicides, so it's just the raking that you're on about. And I've got to say again, we're discussing the raking when this calling is about the decision to consult. Rather, it's not about the raking of the, um, the beach. The raking of the beach may well happen after this consultation it may well do i don't know i'm not an expert we're all here um but there does appear to be a little bit of fear mongering you know i'm seeing uh, images of washed out um drains which are storm drains i might add so after the heavy downpour you're going to have a, um, some debris on the beach which we all know and you use the word toxic uh you don't know that it's toxic it's just debris left in the drains that gets washed out after uh, a heavy storm I would like to say, what what do you feel about the um, the climate uh, emergency that's been declared? And do you not think, on the back of that, that we should consult? And this is what this is about, about the raking of the beach and the declaration of the climate emergency basically changes everything. And we then have to start from scratch looking at all of this uh, and hence the decision to have this consultation, which I will reiterate that's what the call is about about the decision to consult it's got nothing to do with raking you know you're, you're cherry picking the beach management plan mm -hmm. uh, which is from 10 years ago about you know you, you talked about enhanced raking you've talked about herbicides you don't uh, you know you don't you're not happy with them but you're happy with the raking and you want it to go ahead um it may well happen i don't know i'm not an expert but until we hear from the experts until the consultation with all parties as you've said is carried out why should we carry on when it could be potentially to the detriment of the beach? So, again, I reiterate, it's about, it's about the decision to consult. It's not about any uh, practices of beach management uh, within that plan, which is 10 years old and since we've had the climate emergency declared. So, can I just ask your thoughts on that, please? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cartier. Um, the, the decision clearly says it calls for a, call, a pausing of the vegetative vegetative beach management works, which is raking. So I think that's quite clear what it, what that uh, decision is about. And it's really the nub of the issue. I mean, I'm glad you've raised it because it's that pausing is, is, the, is the problem. And that's why I refer to the 2010 agreement, which was re-ratified in 2016, is that is our current agreement. And all we're asking for is to abide by that current agreement whilst we have the consultation. Because if we pause any longer on the um, 
on the vegetative management of that upper area of the beach. Um, we risk in 18 months time when we get to a decision that that area will have changed so much that the work will be so difficult to undo um, that the, 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 whole, the whole scenery has, has changed there that we might not be able to undo it. And I think that would be a bad decision at that point. That would be, when I say irreversible, that's what I mean. We end up in a point where, no matter what the consultations might come out as an answer, we actually have a situation that we can't undo. I think it's perfectly reasonable to carry on with the current beach management arrangement until we reach an idea of where we want to go with the beach. As for the um, uh, climate emergency, well, yeah, it was universally voted for. We're all aware of climate change. We're all aware of, of issues um, environmental. When I showed you the picture of the drains, I'm not saying that's not a criticism. What I'm saying is the drain system there, and I think it's universally accepted, um, washing a road onto a beach uh, isn't acceptable. Natural England say it isn't acceptable. They highlight drainage in their report as needing addressing. That is an issue that we need to address as a matter of urgency at, at the council level. I think that was all the questions, was it? Was there anything else? Gone. Can I just ask members to be a bit briefer in their questions and uh, witnesses and Councillor Garner to be a bit briefer in their answers? Uh, now to Councillor and Adrian Jones. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Gardner, for, <clears throat> for your statement. Um, I, I agree with you that we should consult, but I suggest that it's uh, contradictory to both believe in consultation and at the same time to prevent it. Um, you seem to be saying that we should have consulted earlier, but because we didn't consult earlier, we shouldn't consult now either. That certainly seems to be the logic of what you're saying. So my specific question to you um, is this. Uh, isn't the call-in simply a device to achieve a pre predetermined outcome by denying the consultation that you and we all believe is a good thing? Uh, thank you, Councillor Jones, and thank you for keeping the question brief. Um, no, the call-in is about um, the decision. The, call -in is, the decision has been called in, and the element, the contentious part of it, is the pausing of vegetative beach works. Now, fair enough, the committee will make its decision later. My point on the pausing is that it risks an outcome that we can't undo and therefore it, there's almost um, there's a risk of predetermination there's a risk of going down a, a poor road there um, as for consultation go for it we are more than happy to have consultation on this as long as politicians look at the consultation listen to the consultation and act upon the people's wishes of the consultation councillor jones uh, if if that comes, if you vote for that, if we get that, if if I'll be dancing down Market Street later. Love well, you know it. And you, can, <laughs> you can join me. Okay. I, the final question I've got here is from Councillor Tony Cox again. So Tony, briefly, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll try to pose this as a question as best I can, because uh, I don't know whether this deliberate. Uh, obtusity or whether we're just um, trying to obfuscate here, but councillors are, are, are speaking to uh, Councillor Gardner with regards to the um, call-in, but what they're obviously not referencing is the actual decision. Is it fair, Councillor Gardner, to say that the reason the call-in came uh, about is that number one says the contents of the report uh, uh, from Natural England have been noted. Well, we don't wish to note it, we wish to question it because we don't agree with it, uh, parts of it. Um, particularly because uh, there hasn't been a uh, last record, the last recorded conditions assessment by Natural England was in October 2012. Uh, the second one is the pausing of vegetation, which you just said uh, effectively means pausing raking now before we have actually had a consultation. For those members on, who are the other side of the fence uh, bench to me, they should understand the um, notion of failure to agree. 
and we are looking at it, this in the terms of a failure to agree that we don't agree with uh, the cabinet member's decision and we should carry on as what went before until uh, we have a resolution that that's not what's happened we just immediately guillotined raking so we don't agree with number two number three councillor gardner again uh, i'm correct in saying ongoing engagement we don't agree with this bit either because the dialogue with the stakeholders uh, and other statutory bodies including national england environment agency marine management at no point in any of that does it mention local residents it's almost as if local residents don't matter to the cabinet member which is exactly why i'm so riled and they're so riled and why my inbo inbox is so full so that's exactly why the call-in is valid and also with regards to raking from march and, and uh, holding back the raking you can't rake between Mar uh, uh, between September and March, you can't rake. And then immediately we came into the COVID-19, uh, so no raking was going to take place anyway. So we haven't actually delayed anything. What we're going to be calling for later on, or I will uh, as my resolution, is a genuine consultation, a consultation where we don't just speak to the people who we wish to hear from, who we have the same opinion was, uh, of. We actually listen to the people who actually live in the area as well. So do you agree with me, Councillor Gardner, that that is why it's a valid uh, uh, call-in? Absolutely, Councillor Cox. Everybody has been consulted on this, apart from the people of Hoy Lake. You know, there's the uh, Coastal Advisory Group, um, you know, somewhat a mysterious group that advise the council. Um, we don't know who they are. We've never met them. Never been introduced to them. Um, board members have never been um, invited to any of the discussions um, on any of these issues. Um, again, we we couldn't meet with Natural England to to discuss. Um, so, uh, I think as as, as far as um, consultation has, has has gone so far, it's woeful. And um, you know we've got to have faith in the future of a consultation. Um, and so far, it, it doesn't it doesn't bode well, as you said from your statement, um, your question in item three. Where is where is the people of Hoy Lake in this? Thank you, Councillor Gardner. I don't have any more hands up. Um, so in that case, uh, thank you for your contribution. I will now move to the Cabinet member, the decision taker, uh, Councillor Liz Gray, to outline the reasons for her decision. Councillor Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members, um, for this opportunity to explain my decision. As has been said um, already in this meeting, it's it's not actually any kind of beach management plan that has been called in. We're yet to get to that stage. What has been called in is the cabinet member report and the recommendations in which I agree to pause management of the beach to enable scientific evidence to be gathered and residents to be engaged with in a dialogue about the future of the beach. That is what's been called in. And if you call in a decision, it cannot become policy and acted upon until the committee vote on it. So the common sense recommendations in the decision have been affected. They've been reduced or delayed considerably by this very call in. I know that committee members will have looked closely at the report and its recommendations. So you know that we wanted scientific evidence and to engage with local stakeholders Yet the reasons given for the call-in include points arguing that we haven't done this. The signatories may not have actually read the full report because if they had, they would not say that it was ill-conceived and ideologically motivated as it makes clear that Natural England were consulted and gave us a full report on the legal parameters for beach management. We also consulted with leading local scientific experts in beach ecology and management it was, in fact, uh, a very well-informed decision. The signatories to this call-in argue that no consultation has taken place, and yet both recommendations three and four of my decision report ask for stakeholder engagement. Recommendation three asks for, quote, full independent environmental and scientific studies and stakeholder engagement. Recommendation four asks for quote, ongoing engagement and dialogue with local stakeholders. So perhaps they didn't read that bit. They appear to have called in a decision which, in the reasons they give for that call-in, they say they actually want. 
They also complain that the decision breaks our current agreement with Natural England, who have not consented to this. I hope you can see that in the Natural England witness statement, Natural England themselves refute this completely. We do not need, they say, their permission to stop spraying or raking. They can't withdraw assent once given, even when circumstances change. And they have changed. Circumstances have really changed, as councillors have already referenced. We now know a great deal more than we did about, than our predecessors did when they asked to spray and rake the beach. We now know that glyphosate is a highly dangerous chemical with no place on any beach. We now know that we're in a climate and biodiversity crisis, and we as a council have declared this unanimously. That was not empty rhetoric for most of us, and we must act on this in everything we do. We now know that sea levels are rising dangerously and that coastal communities are at significant risk of flooding. Lastly, the signatories say that the decision becomes irreversible. It doesn't. We can spray and rake the beach tomorrow or any time after if we have permission. I asked the committee to think very carefully indeed about this particular point. Do you want to vote against the scientific evidence? Do you want to vote against the latest advice from Natural England? Do you want to vote against the environment and climate declaration for which you voted? I urge you to vote with the evidence and with the science to enable us to investigate what is happening in terms of natural processes on Hoylake Beach. This is not possible if we rake away all the evidence. We need those surveys that Natural England call for in their report and which are called for in my decision. We cannot rake and survey the beach at the same time. A pause is needed to collect the evidence. I would urge members of the public to read carefully the Natural England witness statement for this meeting. It's on our website. Councillor Gardner was not correct to suggest that they refer to a part of the beach. They refer to all of the beach, as is clear from the reference to the sites covered at the start of the Natural England document. It's on the council website and it's been sent to members, so it is available to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray, for outlining the reasons for your decision. Um, I'm now going to invite members to ask Councillor Gray any questions that they may have. So if you'd like to put your hands up um, and I'll go in the order that I see them. First one I have is Councillor Tony Cox. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to say first, um, with regards to the letter from National England, that it's an absolute disgrace, Councillor Gray, that we've only had that uh, this afternoon. It was uh, dated as one of your colleagues has just actually suggested the 12th of August, and I think it's an absolute disgrace that we uh, received at a half past two when we were having a call in at four o'clock. The fact that it's on the website now is of neither use nor ornament when we're one hour in to the uh, debates, to be fair. Um, I'll start with um, a very simple one which you just referenced with regards to the, to the letter. Um, uh, so the, the uh, gentleman from National England has said all of the beach uh, cannot be raked. Well, actually he doesn't. Um, he mentioned the intertidal uh, area is what he mentioned. Now, I was going to save this for one of your scientific experts to... Uh, you know, one of the degree level scientific experts who might be able to educate me. Um, but I think I'm correct in saying the two zones are the intertidal zone and the supertidal zone or the splash zone. So if I'm not mistaken, owing to the fact that the beach where the grass grows doesn't actually get submerged on a daily basis with the normal uh, tidal movements, that would make it a supertidal uh, zone, not a uh, intertidal zone. So therefore, Literally everything that is within the Natural England report um, suggests that or talks about, in fact, 12 times it mentions it, the intertidal zone. And what we are suggesting by raking the area where the two grass species, the invasive grass species, which we are allowed to uh, rake, it actually says within the Natural England report, we can do that, um, are within the supertidal zone. So, would you agree with me that by raking the area that is not in the intertidal zone would not in any way, shape or form break the guidance from Natural England? Um, 
I'll leave it to the experts to confirm the, the details of this because neither you nor I are beach experts, so it's probably best to refer to the experts. But at the same time, I do know that the advice that we have from Natural England and the original report and the document that you're just referring to now, uh, and by the way, I believe it's perfectly reasonable, it's perfectly normal, and previous committees have involved um, documents being released um, late in the day. That's not unprecedented. Um, I'll leave it to experts, but I do know that the documents, both natural England documents, refer to the entire beach. They actually, the, the document term that you've just referred to actually says which areas are being talked about at the start of the document. So they actually say regarding beach management at, and then they talk about which designated nationally and internationally significant designations they're talking about, and they're talking about the whole beach. Thank you. Uh, that, that is actually, if I can share, that is actually contrary to what it says, I'm afraid. And uh, the, the only other, uh, um, I, I, well, I could ask questions all day. Again, I'll let other members come in and then come back. Um, but it, it, is, it, is it not true that the data, the very selective data that yourselves and other um, interested uh, parties that you have uh, chosen to um, uh, consult with, are using um, records that uh, Natural England were last actually carried out any conditions assessments when you say it is uh, unfavourable it was October 2012 and we're listening to groups and maybe you can explain who they are um, because I certainly haven't got the foggiest but the um, uh, coastal advisory group so that is something you I believe uh, were involved in setting up uh, looking at the members uh, it, it consists of quite a few of your um, uh, experts today and uh, I believe uh, also HBL uh, who are uh, also in favour of naturalising the beach so in your consultation with your stakeholders up to now which has guided you to um, uh, make the decision preemptive decision before a proper consultation um, you have basically consulted with all people who have exactly the same opinion as you so was there anyone on the coastal advisory uh, a group who are now, according to HBL's website, going to advise the Whittle Council on the future of the beach. That's their words, not mine. Uh, was there anyone who had an alternative view to yourself and all of the members? Uh, thank you, Councillor Cox. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had no views on the beach, particularly before this started. Um, I decided to inform myself by speaking to experts and that's what I did, and that's how I developed my view on the beach. I had no predetermined views whatsoever. Um, I listened to the experts. I called together local uh, university experts and local expert practitioners, um, and I spoke to Natural England, and that's how I developed my view on this beach. It was also obviously informed by our, and I include you in this, our declaration of a climate and environment emergency. Um, so that's what informed my views. I, I didn't collect together people who felt the same way as me. I collected together experts and they helped inform my decision. But I did not gather together people who felt the same as I did because I didn't have any predetermined views. Um, I, I do think that your constant reference to the um, date of the last survey is a, a little disingenuous because that, that is the frequency with which surveys are carried out. And they would probably be carried out more frequently um, it's not just Wirraborough Council that's had hundreds of millions of pounds slashed from its budget by this Tory government. It's also Natural England and other government bodies. So if they were funded adequately, perhaps they'd uh, survey our beaches more frequently. Thank you. Well, sorry, Chair, just to come back on that, uh, on a, a, a point of order almost, um, uh, uh, when we're talking about disingenuous, Councillor Greg, I think it's disingenuous for you to suggest you haven't got a predetermined outcome uh, for this because on the 14th of the 9th, 19, you sent Andrew an email that said there will be no more raking of the the full area that was rigged before. I think that's pretty categoric before we've actually had a consultation, wouldn't you say? Okay, Councillor Gray, and then I'm going to move on. Okay, there'll be no more raking because we haven't decided on our new be uh, beach management strategy. Once our new beach management strategy, and I've been quite clear, and I've said this to residents as well, I'm open to the idea that there could be an amenity beach that may involve some raking if it's possible and if it's allowed by Natural England. I don't know what that future beach management strategy is going to look like. We haven't been able to start thinking about that because you called in the decision to look for evidence. Okay. In the order I've got now is uh, Councillor Brain, then Councillor Musprat, then Councillor Johnson. So, Councillor Brain. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Councillor Gray, I wonder if you could just clarify for the uh, benefits of the committee the, the, the nature of the relationship between our council and Natural England. Obviously, we're, we're getting advice from them, uh, guidance. Uh, what, what are the consequences if we choose not to follow their advice and guidance? Um, thank you, Councillor Brain. Um, the consequences are quite dire, actually. It would be a terrible waste of taxpayers' money because we would be liable to quite considerable fines. At the very least, it would be tens of thousands, and it could be um, a lot higher than that, depending on the context. But if we don't follow the guidance very carefully of the statutory bodies overseeing the beach, then we're in trouble, basically. We would be breaking the law and we would be punished and fined. It would be a reputational issue for the council as well, but it would be a waste of taxpayers' money. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. I'm sure members will find that a very helpful answer. Thank you, Councillor Brown. I have now got um, Councillor Musprat. Can't hear you, Christine, if you unmuted yourself. Uh, sorry, Councillor Agent Jones as well. Can you just mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Musprat. Hold on. Hold on. I can hear you now. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, question, uh, Councillor Gray. You mentioned about the climate change and um, the effects on the beaches. Can you explain to me what difference it would make if we rake the beach or if we don't rake the beach? Because we seem to be coming into the argument of raking. So I, I'd like to know what the pros and cons of it are, please. Thank you. Um, I'll, again, I'll, I'll leave the, the science to the scientists. We've got a couple of scientists as witnesses who will be speaking shortly and who will presumably be explaining that. Um, my understanding is that a, a raked beach, so as it was previously, so sprayed with glyphosate and raked, uh, is loose sand, obviously, and, and that, that um, causes windblown sand issues. But also, um, it, it's uh, all ecosystems, all habitat is raked away. There's nothing growing there. There's nothing living there. Um, and so there's no contribution in terms of the biodiversity crisis and um, there's, there's no contribution in terms of the climate crisis either because there's no storage of carbon. If you do have any vegetation that you have growing there, um, draws down carbon so it, can, it helps contribute to the um, reduction of the climate emergency. And we've declared a climate emergency. We've said that we will play our part. Um, we're a part of cool, the COOL2 strategy that says that we will work towards um, net zero. As soon as we can, we want to work towards net zero. We've declared as a council that we'll aim for 2030. Now, that's, that, that requires quite a lot of, of uh, reduction in carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases, and where possible, the drawdown and, and carbon storage as well. And that's there's, there's increasing evidence. The government's own advisory body suggests that there's increasing evidence that coastlines can offer some of the best carbon storage around. Um, for example, salt, salt marsh stores 40 times as much as most forests. So it's really important and we're being advised by, by most uh, people who understand about carbon storage that we need to take our seas and our coastlines very seriously in terms of, of storing carbon. Um, and so this, this would help any vegetation at all on the beach would really help in terms of our locally determined um, contribution towards fighting the climate emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councillor Johnson, then Councillor Cook, then Councillor Kenny. So, Jenny, you there? Thank you, yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Liz. Um, why has the raking stopped on this amenity beach? It surely needs management now, otherwise it's going to become this salt marsh that I haven't met one resident who actually wants this to become a salt marsh. I think this is about you listening to local residents and your ward councillors not you making a seemingly unilateral decision. I'm hearing very much an autocratic cabinet type system here where you are deciding on what you think is best for our area. And yet you're not properly consulting, I'd suggest necessarily with your ward councillors um, and listening to them. For instance, the Natural England meeting, it would make perfect sense for three or indeed six ward councillors to have been there and to have listened to that particular meeting, yet they seemingly were not invited. So there's a number of questions there, but the first one is, why has raking stopped on this amenity beach? Because my view is the longer you leave that, the harder it will be to draw back from that decision, which I think you, it sounds like you're, you're making in a unilateral way at the moment. Thank you. 
Um, well, unilateral decision making is the nature of, of, of a cabinet member decision. It was obviously an informed decision based on, on the evidence that I was given um, by speaking to Natural England and by speaking to local experts. So it, it wasn't just on a whim. But one person makes that decision under a cabinet system. We're, not, we're still in the cabinet system and we were at that point. Um, and we are moving to the committee system whereby a group of us will make decisions. Um, and hopefully that will be a lot better for everybody. But the cabinet system does mean that one person makes that decision. There's, there's, that's just the way it is. Um, and it was an informed decision. I stopped. I asked for a pause in raking because we needed to collect evidence. You can't collect evidence about what's happening naturally on a beach if you rake away that evidence. It's quite straightforward. I've said to somebody else recently, if you want to know what colour somebody's natural hair is, you have to let it grow. You can't just keep shaving it off and guess what's happening there. So that's basically what we were doing with the beach. We have to pause vegetative maintenance to find out what's happening on the beach so surveys can be done. It's quite straightforward. That's why it was paused. Thank you. Can I, can I just go back there? Please, yeah, Tom, Tom. yeah. Of if, if we did that to every part of every area, we would have an absolute complete mess. Um, if we did that to our own front lawns, if we did it as we found recently with COVID, when vegetation has been allowed to grow everywhere without any control and any management, it's a complete mess. And so some decisions might be right for the climate, and but we also need to manage that as well with what's right for our local communities. There needs to be surely, I would think, an area of amenity beach there for our communities for the benefit of many generations going forwards. Um, you know, and I'm, I think my, my grandparents will be shocked at the very thought that we should be even thinking about that becoming a green area. It's a beach and it should be retained as a beach and you need to be working on that absolutely now. Um, well, can I allow to answer that, Chair? Sure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I, th I should think that your grandparents would probably quite be quite alarmed by the climate emergency as well and by the environment emergency. The context is different. Things have changed. Just Even in just the last few years, we know a lot more um, about the dangers that we face in terms of the environment and climate emergency and all our decision making needs to be made with that in mind it can't just be about aesthetics it's got to be about long-term planning and long-term protection and i would suggest that um, the extreme weather events that we are having far more frequently in across the world but it's happening here right now um, should alert us to the fact that we do need to think about the context of the climate emergency and we can't just be thinking about aesthetics. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray. I've got Councillor Chris Cook next. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, I'm sure like all councillors that uh, we have had time to, to read uh, in full the, uh, the Holiday Beach Management Report, about 10 pages long, um, which was produced on the 10th of March. Um, I'm referring to the end of that report. I'm not just testing people you know, to ensure they've read it right to the end, but right at the end, there is the environment and climate implications. Uh, so, Councillor Gray, I'd just like to read a section to you uh, in the light of uh, one of the reasons for the call-in, uh, which was that it was claimed that the decision by the Cabinet was based on you know, ideological con considerations. Uh, so, I'm just going to read this. 10.1, the recommendations presented within this report will have a positive effect on climate change and will support the Council's response to the climate emergency as follows. One, the significant reduction in mechanical maintenance will immediately reduce greenhouse gas emissions through transport via a reduction in the burning of fossil fuels. Two, the development of salt marsh and sand dunes will serve to provide for a diverse ecological vegetative habitat capable of extensive carbon storage that will mitigate climate change and contribute to 2040 net zero carbon targets. And finally, three, permitting the development of embryonic salt marsh and sand dunes will both protect current and enhance future biodiversity. Now, this report was uh, compiled by a bit of a council officer, Colin Clayton, Assistant Director of Community Services, who may be here today. Uh, now, that seems to me, a uh, very objective, um, scientific-based, you know, non-ideological um, you know, conclusions. C could you confirm that that report was written you know, outside of any ideological uh, concerns, but was actually based on the facts as you saw them and as the, uh, the, the council officer who wrote them saw them? 
Yes, this was this report was written by council officers and um, signed off by me. Obviously, I was in discussion with council officers, and we were in discussion with Natural England and the local experts. Um, but it, it it's not ideological at all. It's based on fact. It's it's based on you know everybody's read the research about the climate emergency and the environment emergency, and I don't think there'd be many people here who would deny that we need to address both of those. Um, and you're absolutely right, it's it's not, it's fact-based, it's not ideological, um, it's it's in response to an emergency which we're all residents face and which we have an absolute duty to protect them against. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, okay, I've got Councillor Kenny, then Greeny, then Cameron. So, Councillor Kenny. Yes, thank you, Chair. Councillor Greg, um, Councillor Gardner earlier said that everybody had been consulted on the whole question of Hoylake Beach management, apart from the Hoylake residents. Can you confirm that the long-term strategy for the management of Hoylake Beach will actually include consultation with the local communities? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. Yes, um, I can confirm that we planned uh, before this call in and we still plan to engage with local residents as much as they want to. And we wanted we want to engage with with as many stakeholders as possible, because obviously it's not just we're all um, it's not just um, Hoylake residents that that use the beach, but all stakeholders involved um, in, in working the beach and, and using the beach. Yes. And I'm, in particular, I'm, I'm very keen to know um, what local people think. I get emails from lots of local residents, but we haven't had that proper um, independent uh, engagement with stakeholders that we really planned to have before this call-in. So the call-in has delayed that stakeholder engagement, which is a shame. But yes, absolutely, in answer to your question, yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Brian. Um, Councillor Greeny, your hand's gone down, but it was up before. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Gray, do you first line of the call in is based on it says it based on your decision was on ideology and against the residents wishes but would you like to take the opportunity to agree with me that the actual call in itself is based on ideology <laughs> the call in itself has prevented further consultation with the local residents thank you thank you um yes i i i do actually agree with you i think that this has been politicized and i think anybody looking at my statements historically not just now but over the last year and a half i think anybody looking can see that i've not done anything to try and exacerbate that politicization that's that's happened um mainly be by the local councillors i think have politicized they've been quite ideological and they the call in itself it could be described as ill-conceived and ideologically motivated yes i do agree with you thank you thank you okay mine Final question I've got here is uh, Councillor Cameron. Hello. Not final question, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm going up now. Yeah, I'm still um, reeling from unilateral decisions and references to ideology. Um, really, a cabinet member, I would assume, does consult, and you said you did consult with scientists. So uh, the Natural England um, information that we received just a couple of hours ago. Uh, is very concerned about the drainage issues from North Parade. Um, you're concerned about raking the beach that hasn't been raked for two years in case evidence is removed. But um, even fixing this drain would make the scientific studies better, wouldn't it? So, yes, it's complex. And raking being paused is the problem we have with this process. Not whether we consult or not. I understand why you constantly chipping in with that and why everybody's been very well briefed to do that. We all agree consultation is required. We all agree wide consultation is required. Who advised you to pause the raking and where are we on this drainage issue? Because you won't get a proper scientific read until the drainage problem is rerouted. Right. Thank you. Yes, I do agree with you. The drainage is a, a really significant issue and I think that's something that both sides in this particular um, call in debate can totally agree on it's uh, the drains are um, obviously broken and they obviously need fixing 
Um, and we do, we, officers were in discussion about how to um, go about that because obviously that's an extraordinarily expensive job um, to, to divert highways drainage away from the beach will be a, a, a very big task. They're, they're, I think I believe they're Victorian drains um, and they do need fixing. Everybody agrees that they need fixing and that those toxic chemicals perhaps coming from the drains onto the beach, that's not much, I don't think, but when it happens, it's not. It's very, very far from ideal, um, and we want to so we want to solve that as soon as we can. So we are looking at ways to perhaps incorporate the the drainage works with any um, flood defence work that goes on there, uh, and we'd like to get that done as soon as possible. The call in obviously has delayed all of these conversations because you can't move forwards if you don't know which way committee is going to um, suggest that you go forward. So the vote. Um, would enable that to those conversations to carry on. Both sides are agreed. The drains are a problem, and the the, the photographs of of you know dank, dismal-looking vegetation are invariably of the drainage issues as well. So it would be in in my interest to get the drains fixed, and I really do want them fixed as soon as possible. And I've asked officers to get them fixed as soon as possible. Clearly, it's not just the call in. That to say that is 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 um, not not the whole picture. We've also got the COVID crisis. That is also because that itself delayed the call in. So that is also delaying the fixing of the drains. But the main problem is just we you know we know that's going to be a massively expensive. Um, thing to do. So we've got to make sure that we use taxpayers' money as wisely as possible. And so the discussions are happening about how best to do that. But everybody, everybody wants the drains fixed. Yes. So sorry, my question was, who advised you to pause all raking so the scientists could gather their evidence? Because you referred to somebody's roots and hair dye. I want to know where the scientific evidence was to pause the raking, which had not even happened for a year before you chose to pause it. The drains weren't that urgent. You're happy to go into consultation with open drains. You pause the raking. And now we're talking about delays to consultation. Who advised you to pause the raking? Which scientists need it to not be raked for several years before they can gather any evidence? Um, I believe that it was Natural England who are the main people who have suggested that we need to have clear surveys of what's happening on the beach. And since they are the statutory body in charge of the beach, uh, I, I took their advice very, very seriously. If we don't take their advice, then as has been said before, we are potentially breaking the law and potentially in danger of reputational issues and huge fines, which would be a waste of taxpayers' money that could presumably be spent on fixing the drains. So I decided to listen very carefully to that natural England advice to proceed with surveys. But also, we had a coastal advisory group um, of local experts, and their advice was also surveys. You must do surveys to find out what is actually happening on the beach naturally. And you cannot survey what's happening on the beach if you rake away the evidence so could you share that with us, the, the advice from Natural England to pause all raking across the beach in order to gather evidence? Because what the reports we're seeing become come after the date when you wanted to pause raking. So I want to know the date and by whom that you were told to pause raking. I initially decided to pause while I sought information from experts. That's why. That and was the, the unilateral was, bit. The information was. I understand which now. Came shortly afterwards. Yeah, you I understand the U.S. now. Hang on, can we let Councillor Gray finish? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. The pausing is to find out what experts suggest and what needs to happen. They immediately suggested you need to get proper surveys. They couldn't just say what's happening without looking closely at the beach. So all the experts that were consulted said you need to have proper uh, botanical, geomorphological and various other surveys done. And they can't happen at all with any raking in two and a half years. They can't. Well, I've only been cabinet member for a year and a half, but they can't. Right. They can't happen. They the surveys can't happen if you're raking away the evidence. It's it's just it's to be honest. It's a really weird. It's a really weird thing to suggest that we carry on raking whilst doing surveys to see what's happening there naturally. It's no. just a very strange thing to suggest. Well, it isn't because the vegetation appears so rapidly. And the high tide then makes it all soggy and washes it away. Um, I'd like to see the advice you received and the date you received it, that pausing all raking was required. Please. OK. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gray, is that a request that you can? 
I, I can find out the date of the meeting of the Coastal Advisory Group, but it was uh, it was it was a meeting. Officers were present as well. It was it was a spoken meeting. There weren't it wasn't recorded. There were no written records, so I can't produce some magic records. But it was a group of leading experts were in a room. I was there. Officers were there, and they suggested that we needed to pause raking. Um, so I can't re I can't reproduce any any documents because there weren't documents. But the the Natural England report and my conversations with Natural England in the months leading up to that report. Because obviously the report is dated I think second of March, but there were conversations with Natural England months before that in the previous year as well. And they all suggested that we would need to stop and find out exactly what was happening on that beach to make an informed decision, an evidence based, science led informed decision not possible if you just gung-ho carry on doing especially not a good idea if you've been accused as natural england did tell me that we had been accused of overstepping the mark perhaps with our um, spraying and raking and as such potentially breaking the law so once you find out that the council has perhaps been over maintaining the beach and that that could be um, a legal issue then the precautionary response immediately is to is to stop and find out what's going on stop and find out what you can and can't do stop and find out what you should be doing but you don't just carry on that would be irresponsible okay um hopefully when we get to the new uh, committee system that um, meetings with officers are minuted um so everybody's privy to the information on what's decided um i'm going to okay i'm going to wrap up this now what I've got here is Councillor Cox, then Councillor Collins. Um, so, Mike. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, a full council before COVID, if we can all remember that, uh, both, both sides of the chamber said that we wanted to be more collaborative, working together and get things moving so we can move forward uh, in a positive way. Um, I just don't understand why you didn't consult and didn't allow the ward councillors to be part, to be privy of the coastal advisory group, especially as you were discussing their ward. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is, why haven't you followed through as both groups have said, be more collaborative, and you haven't actually included those ward councillors? Um, Liz. Um, hi, thank you for that. Um, Natural England is a, is a public body, obviously, and residents get in touch with Natural England and get responses. Um, if the ward councillors had wanted to get in touch with Natural England and get a response, then they could easily have done that. They're not an exclusive secret organisation. You know, their website and their phone number is freely available. And I do know, because residents have shown me, that they reply to inquiries quite regularly. So... If the local councillors had wanted to get in touch with Natural England, they could have done so. I got in touch with Natural England. Officers got in touch with Natural England. If the local councillors wanted to do that, then they were free to do so. Uh, well, that, that doesn't answer the question. I asked you why weren't they involved in the Coastal Advisory Group, which was specifically looking at the Hoylake Beach and, and Rake and what have you. You, knew, you, know, you know it was going to be discussed. Surely they should have been invited to that group. Yes, it was a coastal advisory group of experts, and they're not beach experts. Neither are you, but you were involved. No, that's why I called a coastal advisory group of beach experts to advise me. I didn't call non-experts to advise me. I wanted experts to advise me because I'm not an expert and I had decisions to make. So I wanted the leading experts to advise me. The local councillors are not leading experts, so I didn't ask them to come. Right. And again, I'm going back to... We wanted to be more collaborative and you seem to just push them to a side, not being involved in any decision that would affect their ward. And you've just ignored the opportunity to discuss and be collaborative. And that's what's disappointing is that we have the opportunity to work together or we had them. Um, and that's what both sides of the chamber did say we wanted to do. And it doesn't seem to have been done in this case. Yes, just just briefly, I have been collaborative. I have worked with each of the other parties throughout the whole tenure of, of my being cabinet member, um, I have invited and most of them have attended. Uh, and I've had meetings with each of the other parties. I've not um, been unilateral in my decision making. I've asked experts to help me. And wherever I, there's been a, you know, a, a, an opportunity, I've spoken with other parties and I've also had numerous meetings with the transport spokes and the environment spokes from each of the other parties. So I would I would suggest that I've been highly collaborative in my tenure as cabinet member, knowing, especially knowing that we're moving to the committee system, which I voted for wholeheartedly. 
I wanted to engage with the other parties as much as possible. So there, there, there have been numerous meetings with the other parties and I've been very happy to work with them. Thank you. I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just on the back of that question, Councillor Graham, you said you wanted um, experts and the war councillors weren't experts. Um, why was Hoylake Village Life included in that meeting? Are they experts? Hoylake Village Life attend some somebody attended um I can't remember whether they were a member of Hoylake Village Life, but they Hoylake Village Life themselves were not uh, in attendance, I don't think, at any of our meetings. Um but we had individuals, but I I'll have to check whether they were actually members of Hoylake Village Life. I do know I mean I can provide you with a list of the who the Coast Advisory Group um are. They are, you know, mostly postdoctorate experts in 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 beach management and ecology, um, and that was the main reason for calling them. If anybody is also anybody from that group is also a member of Hoylake Village Life, it's not that I would know. Okay. Okay. Um, finally, Councillor Cox wants to come back in again, so if we can keep them points brief and questions. That'd be great, Tony. Yeah, thanks. I'll try my best. Um, yeah, that's interesting about HVL, seeing as they've categorically stated they are on it. Uh, so I'll be interested to see who sits on the Coastal Advisory Group going forward, uh, Councillor Greg. Um, I think if there's anything that uh, justifies the amount of hours that I put in to the uh, delivering the committee system, and that was a lot, I might add, I think uh, uh, this process has actually been it, because I don't think it has been collaborative in any way, shape or form. Uh, two, two, two points. The first one is, and I, for all the people who don't know Hoy like that well, for, um, I, I, I want to make it absolutely clear: the amenity beach is the amenity beach that it, for the only amenity area and community area that the people of Hoy Lake have. There is a tiny park uh, near to the Plaster of his Arms, but other than that, the amenity beach, the whole point of it when it was built by the Victorians was that was for the people. Now, to um, wouldn't it be better? Councillor Gray, rather than looking at effectively astroturfing and then turning it into a salt marsh, uh, which would effectively exclude people from using it as an amenity beach, wouldn't it be better to speak out um, in the interest of climate change and carbon capture about the potential for Greenbelt being added to uh, a development land uh, in the local plan, rather than accepting that uh, as, as, a, as a given and then carpeting my uh, my residence beach which will exclude them and then the second one is with regards to the consultation um i'm sure i'm i'm, I'm almost convinced that the residents who are on this call tonight will have something to say with regards to consultation and speaking to them um but the amount of people who have contacted me who don't believe that the consultation will have any bearing on the outcome whatsoever with them as local residents because if I add a pound for every time you said experts this evening, I'd be quite a wealthy individual because what that smacks of is everything anyone says locally that contradicts what yourself or the experts, ecological experts wish to see will be disregarded. So what can you say to my residents who are listening to this or they're involved in the meeting that their views are actually going to take uh, any uh, have any weight whatsoever in the consultation because I genuinely don't believe it's going to be listening to you. Well, are you finished? Thank you. It's hard to answer that question really because it was more of a diatribe than a question. I, um, I just first of all, I'll just point out that the beach wasn't built by Victorians. The beach actually predates humans. Um, it's in terms of the consultation. Of course, their views will be taken into account. Of course, we'll listen to their views. And I can say that I can say categorically that if it's possible to please all the people who have different views and to have some sort of compromise that will enable everybody to get from that beach what they want, then that would be my choice. I would I would really like everybody to be happy with that beach. In the context of an environment and climate emergency and also in the context of our duty to protect our residents from flooding and coastal erosion and primarily in the context of the legal parameters of what we can and can't do according to natural England, that's how we'll make our decision. But how about we'll just a compromise then we rate the supranational, uh, uh, super, super national, pardon me, Freudian slip. 
uh, the uh, super uh, tidal area, which is not mentioned whatsoever in the uh, Natural England report. So I think that would be a very good compromise, in my opinion. I'll have to just clarify again. The Natural England report covers the entire beach. The Natural England report, both statement, the witness statement from Natural England covers the entire beach. They are talking about the whole beach. You keep suggesting that they're not talking about part of the beach. They're talking about extensively. They're talking about the whole beach. Hoylake Beach is one of the biggest most vast expanse of, of, of open space available to any any rural residents at all um, and I don't know whether you're just talking about the little strip by the prom but the whole beach is covered by very very important national and international um, designations to protect the ecosystems there and to protect the various species that live there and we've got a duty under legislation we've got a duty to protect those those internationally and nationally designated areas and they cover the whole beach and when natural england who are responsible for overseeing our management of those protected sites when they refer to, to those sites they're referring to the whole beach and that's made categorically clear in both documents so why you keep saying intertidal areas and, and other areas that the intertidal area covers practically the whole beach anyway but you're actually that natural england are talking about the whole beach Chair, if I can, I'm really sorry, Chair, to hijack the committee. Like, if that is the case, that it, it mentions the whole beach, the intertidal zone, we will have that absolutely clarified by our experts this evening and going forward. And I would suggest that you are completely being disingenuous on that list. Uh, it, 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 it does not in any way, shape or form mention the whole beach. It mentions the intertidal zone 12 times. It mentions it 12 times, not once, 12 times. So... The, uh, I, again, I'm no beach expert, neither are you, neither of neither HVL, but um, the, it does mention when you read uh, very basic data on beaches, intertidal zone and uh, supratidal zone, simple as that. There are very specific different areas and the supratidal zone uh, would, the, uh, would fit the criteria, in my opinion, of where the grasses actually are. So the, it, it does not speak um to the whole beach at all it really doesn't it took can i just clarify this just the natural second, statement got, regarding... please, please 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 just one second i don't think we're going to get an answer to this resolution on um no, and no, we're no. not haven't got um unfortunately um experts from natural england here and you know members have been reminded the weight they should put or can put to to statements hopefully this can be clarified later in the meeting um but Unless you've got added anything else new to add, Liz or Tony, on those issues, that I'll move on. I was just going to just going to point out the what's publicly available on the website and what um, everybody's been sent, and that is the opening lines of the Natural England statement, which says North Wirral um, Hoylake. North Wirral Foreshore Site of Special Scientific Interest, Mersey Narrows, North Wirral Foreshore Special Protected Area, Ramsar D, um, Site, D Estuary Special Area of Conservation. That's the entire beach. Okay, I'm sure we can question some of your witnesses later on on that. Is that okay, Tony? Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, I'm going to take one last question and then we'll move on. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Yes, just a very quick search has says that HVL, so Hoylake Village Life, are part of the new Coastal Advisory Group who will act as advisors to Wirral Council as a new beach management agreement with Natural England emerges. So that's very clear statements just from a two minute search there. So they're obviously part of your um, advisory committee there. So thank you, Chair, for, for, for asking me to, to comment. I would say ward councillors matter. And I do think within this that you are disregarding the views of the locality. I really think, Liz, that you're talking a lot about I, but there's very little collaborative. And I appreciate that you're listening to experts. And that's obviously incredibly important. But alongside that, I would say are the residents' views. And the residents in our locality are also incredibly important. And I'm very sorry, but with all due respect, I simply do not think you're listening to the residents or indeed involving our ward councillors. And... The, the, the thought that a cabinet member should be talking, I unilaterally make decisions, absolutely sends shivers down my spine. No, a cabinet member should, yes, be taking evidence, but they need to also listen to the locality, to the people locally and to what residents are saying. And they are represented in a democratic system by the ward councillors and you should be inviting them to, to Natural England meetings. You should be involving them and you simply haven't done so. 
Thank you. The um, Coastal Advisory Group is that's going to be advising us hopefully in the future is yet to be established. So that, that was going to be referenced in one of the council meetings. So we can't say categorically who's in a committee that hasn't even been established yet. But yes, um, yes, we do plan to engage with stakeholders. Um, we can't engage with stakeholders because uh, we haven't been able to do so so far because this meeting's been has called in the decision to engage with stakeholders. So it's going around in circles to suggest that I should have engaged with stakeholders. Okay, let's let's move on. So uh, I'm now going to move to the second part of the uh, meeting to take evidence uh, from the calling witnesses. So there are council gardeners witnesses first. Um, um, may I just say thanks for joining us and thank you for your patience. Um, the first one I've got is Nicola Bacade. Please tell me if I pronounced your name correctly. Are you there, Nicola? Hello, hi. Hi there. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yes, we, yes because... we can see a coffee table. Um, oh, not me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how I turned that around. I'll turn the camera off if you can hear me. Is that all right? Yeah, that's okay. I'll turn um, the thanks for doing this. Can you still hear me if I can? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us and thanks for your patience. Um, if you'd like to just give us your statement um, for a maximum of five minutes, and then if you're okay, uh, members of the committee, I'll, I'll ask you some questions. So it's over to you. Certainly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you today on what to us is obviously a very important issue. Um, today I'm speaking as a representative of our family-owned and run holiday corporate letting business, which is based in Hoylake. Um, our business, and indeed our passion for it, has been built over the last 35 years through sheer hard work, dedication, and a lot of sacrifices over now two complete generations, and we're going into a third. And we operate in the leisure and tourism sector. Um, our business, obviously our livelihood and our jobs are all now, we feel, being threatened directly um, in these difficult post-COVID times um, for all of it, everybody in our industry by the disastrous decisions that have been taken to stop all raking and any maintenance at all on Hoy Lake Beach. Um, we have five of our 12 executive apartments that are very up close and personal with the grass, the slime and the current stagnant water pools that as our property is actually located on the promenade, literally steps away from the beach, which is the current eyesore. Um, we are simply, quite frankly, devastated by its current shocking, neglected condition. And my regular guests who have visitors every year from all over the world, including places like the USA, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa and the Gambia, are equally shocked and appalled. Um, this is just one quote from a regular and a current guest of mine, Mr. Richard Grannon. Um, what a shame it is to see the once beautiful Hoy Lake Beach becoming a rat and mosquito infested marsh like Parkgate. It was a stunning unspoilt beach. And when I show it online to my now over 240,000 followers worldwide on social media, they cannot believe that it's in the Northwest of England. Please, please, please do not let it continue to deteriorate as its wide open spaces offering views and walking are invaluable. And it is so sad to see how it's currently being ruined. Um, to follow on from that, we as a business have been proud hosts and ambassadors for the Royal and Ancient and obviously spectators who visited Hoy Lake at the two previous British Golf Open Championships. And we're already fully booked with the RNA for the 2023 tournament. Um, I cannot believe that we're Uber Council would like Hoy Lake Beach in its current state to be viewed globally as a representative of the standard of Wirral Beaches. I really am shocked and would sincerely hope they would not think that would be a reflective state of any of our what used to be gorgeous Wirral Beaches. Um, I am also a member of the Wirral Chamber of Commerce and Visit Britain and at a lot of recent Zoom meetings I've listened to statistics that quote that day trippers and staycationers that want UK coastal breaks absolutely demand beautiful beaches that are able to be used and enjoyed by walkers and families with children who just want to relax and make a few sandcastles. Currently, we're failing at providing this and we are directly losing any business perspective or otherwise visitors and the economic effects of this are just disastrous really for Hoy Lakes accommodation providers, restaurants, pubs and even the proposed Beacon project. In my view, no visitors means no spending, which means no economy. 
Um, the current situation is an ecological travesty in my view. Our beach is being taken hostage and used as an experimental guinea pig, quite unfairly singled out, unlike any other Wirral beach. Um, the, now sense really has to prevail and our town needs and indeed deserves a clean rate amenity beach so that we can enjoy it and we can use that as our recreation space. It is the only recreation space that we have in Hoylake. HVL, Hoylake Village Life, talk about a new future for Hoylake Beach, but their plans stretch any hope, imagination and science to its limits. They want to take us into the unknown. The only certainty that any of us have is that a clean, regularly raked, maintained amenity beach works for visitors, businesses, residents, the town and the environment. To me, it's quite simple. You can, and indeed HBL do, quote surveys, reports and experts and projections for Hoy Lake Beach and the foreshore. But these are simply that. They're reports. They're not really the reality. They're an intangible fantasy, but definitely not a certainty. And that is what we need and deserve as council taxpayers, business rate payers who live and work in our wonderful town. At no point, and I want to stress this, has Councillor Gray been interested in consultation, debate or interaction with the local community. I, and I know of many others who have tried to open discussion numerous times, but we've been shut down and at every opportunity, and she's not really taken the time at all to listen or act accordingly. If she had, I believe we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today because she would know the strength of feeling locally with residents and business owners. We have, as a community have been completely ignored, walked all over and totally disregarded. Indeed, I feel like we've been treated as a nuisance because we just won't go away. A large majority of Hoy Lakes residents want the clean amenity beach. Take note of the change.org petition with currently over 2,900 signatures on it and it's growing and Councillor Gardner's postal votes that were taken in 2018 showing that the vast majority of people in Hoy Lake want a clean rate amenity beach that they can use. I realise that some of the councillors this might sound overly emotive and unimportant, but actually we're talking about the future of Hoylake business and jobs like mine. The happiness of the overwhelming number of residents who live here and the continuation of economic prosperity here in our town post-COVID. I want to implore you as councillors to listen to the majority view here in Hoylake that demand the return of our clean beach. We live here, we love and we care about our town and we want our beach back majority views in our world should count they should matter and if you don't believe us then take a poll and let people who live in Hoylake vote HVL claim to speak for Hoylake but they do not on this issue they're representing a tiny minority view currently and this has caused a lot of distress anger and indeed frustration from the community aimed both at them and at Councillor Gray I feel it's finally time for them to listen and it's time for you as councillors please to act on our behalf and help us to save our beach. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you for your contribution and coming and joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to open it up to members' questions. So has anybody got any uh, questions? Um, I'm not, okay, I've got Councillor Johnson. Yes. yes. You say there that you haven't been listened to. Have, have you been questioned at all by um, Councillor Gray? Or have you yes. been asked to be part of an advisory group? Or has anybody that you know in the business and locality been asked to be part of this or not? Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, not, not at all. I, I can't, I've sent numerous emails to Councillor Gray directly, to other council members, asking for consultation, asking for debate. I've even spoken to our local MP, Margaret Greenwood. I cannot get anybody to engage with me, with any of the other local community members. Um, the only people that are being spoken to in Hoylake are Hoylake Village Life, I'm afraid. I, have not, I do not know of any in other individuals that have been spoken to. Emails are sent back, but they are very bog standard emails that, that basically just say, um, you know, that obviously um, discussion will be continued on, on, on an ongoing basis. But it's very thank important thing. Thank you. Just just to, if I can, please chair a supplementary on that. So, so Hoylake Village Life, um, you, are they not then speaking for the community? Well, I think they feel that they're speaking for the community. But what I would say is that if you poll people in Hoylake, and I think that should be done, I really do, in the in the name of democracy, you will find that Hoylake Village Life seem to be representing the view that the beach should be allowed to naturalise. And I that is not, I believe, the 
majority view in Hoylake of residents, business owners, or 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 any or the majority of people that live here. If you live here and you speak to people, you will you will definitely understand that m the majority of people here talk about this issue constantly. They are very very passionate about it and are really really upset that there is no engagement being made with local people on this issue. We're the council taxpayers here. Are you still there, Nicola? Yes, sorry, I am, yes. Okay, thank, no, thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Chris Cook, you want to ask a question? Yeah, that's all right, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for your uh, representation, uh, uh, Nicola. Um, uh, well, I'd, I'd just like to ask uh, the people that you've consulted, uh, local people, and you mentioned uh, visitors as well to the area, you know, tourists, uh, have all of them said they would prefer a totally pristine, you know, sandscape, uninterrupted, you know, with any vegetation whatsoever? Is that what they're looking for? Because, again, I'm sorry to quote uh, Natural, Natural England, again, but in the most recent uh, letter, they're suggesting that actually, um, you know, biodiversity, perhaps a little variation from the bland sort of sand, sorry to rhyme there, uh, you know, might actually uh, encourage a, a certain type of more discerning uh, tourist to the area, you know. Um, I don't know if you've got any response to that at all. Yes, certainly, yes. Well, I, I can speak from my, my experience, if you like. Uh, we, we've been involved in running a family business here in the tourism sector for the last 35 years. We do have visitors from the UK and all over the world, and the overwhelming view of all, and I have to say all of the people that I have had that visit me regularly, um, we operate 52 weeks a year through the winter as well as through the summer. All of them are... are are, are, are in favour of a clean, usable amenity beach. The golden sands that Hoylake is famous for, they see it as a part of our identity. And at the moment, they're horrified that it's disappearing. This is the reason they visit. You know, they, they come, they stay, they spend money, they help with restaurants and pubs and, and they uh, add to the economy here. They are vital, these visitors, whether they come for a day or whether they come for a week. And at the moment, we are losing them because we are not giving them what they want, which is a clean, usable amenity beach with sand. They do not want to see the grass. I can only speak from the people that stay with me, but that is the overwhelming view of over 95% of the people that stay with me. And I have contacted a lot of, of my guests over this issue, knowing that I was coming to speak to you, the councillors, today. And, uh, I mean, that is just one quote that I made from a current guest of mine who has been staying with me for over five years. He came, he comes specifically, my property actually overlooks the beach. I have a balcony. They sit out on the balcony, and currently they're being eaten alive, my guest, by mosquitoes that are, uh, are being attracted by the, the current vegetation that is on the beach. It's causing a lot of issues. It's causing a lot of upset and distress. And yeah, all I can give you is my experience as a um, as a business owner in Hoylake in the tourism sector. And yes, they come to Hoylake for the golden suns. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I notice, Councillor Gray, have your hat. Uh, it's not up anymore. I'm not going to allow anybody who's not from the committee to ask questions. But what you do have an opportunity in your um, summing up at the end of the witness statements. Um, I had Councillor Collins and then Councillor Cox. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for your time um, for, for talking to us. Um, I know you were talking just about how it would affect your business, but being a business owner in Hoylake, knowing them, uh, the, the people who, who you will meet regularly as a business owner, um, you've been in business 30 years. How will losing Hoylake Beach as an amenity beach affect the, business, the rest of the businesses in the local area? Thank you for your question. I, I think it'll uh, it'll be catastrophic locally for businesses and for the future of the economy here in Hoylake. I really do. I'm not overstressing that. I think potentially it's disastrous. Um, that is part a big part. I, I've lived in Hoylake for you know over 30 years now. Um, our family business has been going for 35 years. It is an identity that people 
associate with Hoy Lake. The picture of the sandcastle, the bucket and spade, the clean sands that people can sit on. At the moment, families are not able to do that. They come and stay with me and they end up going to West Kirby or to New Brighton because they cannot sit on Hoy Lake Beach currently. There's a small area left of clean sand by the lifeboat station, but it's getting smaller and smaller literally by the day with the, with the vegetation growing. And they are frustrated and upset by that. Why would they come and stay in Hoy Lake if they cannot use Hoy Lake Beach for what they come to do on it, which is to use it for recreation, for immunity purposes, to allow their children to run around and make sandcastles on, on a, a clean, untainted, you know, untainted beach? That is what they want. And I am really seriously worried, not only about my business, but about all the businesses in Hoy Lake and all the all the businesses that rely on footfall, all the businesses that rely on visitors, restaurants, pubs. Um, wine bars, you know, shops, um, obviously the retail industry, all of those businesses are going to suffer if the people do not, if people do not come to Hoy Lake and they, uh, and they do come for the clean golden sand beach. That's, I'm afraid it's, that's just a fact. That is what they want. That is what attracts them. Thank you. Can I just ask one quick question? Please. Um, please. I know, I know we can't do this, but I'm going to ask you, what would you like to see the outcome of today's meeting. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I would like the outcome of today. Well, of, obviously, I would. My preference would have been for the beach to be continued to be maintained and raked. No, nobody locally wants the use of glyphosate on the beach. We all accept that that is not uh, uh, should not be allowed at all on the beach itself. Raking, I believe, should continue. We should still be able, while this consultation is going on, to use our beach in an, in, as the recreation space that it has always been and, and that it's always been cherished for. And at the moment, we're not able to do that, I'm afraid. And it's horrifying to me when we talk about consultation that may take 12 months, 18 months or two years. Unfortunately, the condition of the beach is getting worse on a daily, even a daily and a weekly basis currently. And I cannot see any light at the end of the tunnel. So I would like the councillors to please listen. I'm imploring you to help us in Hoy Lake to keep our to, to save our beach, to give us back our golden sands, to rake it while the consultation process continues, while the experts are involved. Let the community get involved, let residents get involved, listen to people, listen to what they want, and please try to come up with a compromise where the amenity beach area is kept clean for residents and visitors' use. That is what I am desperately asking all of you to help us to achieve, please. Right, thank you. For that. Thank you. Can I just briefly come in there and... Um, so just for the benefit of witnesses and members of the public, this is a scrutiny meeting. It's a call-in. Um, this, this committee doesn't have the power um, except to refer it back to the Cabinet member or Council. Um, so just, just so everyone's aware of, of that. Uh, Councillor Cox. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I was just sat there watching the wife pour in a glass of wine and longingly looking at it, thinking it was probably oh, inappropriate at the minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Nikki, thanks for your uh, input. I'd just like to uh, say you were fantastic there. And uh, whilst you're not a beach expert, uh, yeah, I think you um, have got a, a reasonable call to call yourself a business ex expert, particularly in the visitor economy. So I hope your um, I hope your comments have actually counted as valid. Uh, in, into the uh, consultation and that going forward. What I'd like to say is um, one of the things within the Natural England report suggests that it could actually, it's a bit optimistic, I would say, but it suggests it could increase uh, visitor numbers due to the green economy. Uh, is it fair to say, going off what you, you've you heard from your uh, visitors and what's gone in your visitor book and, and the comments, which is quite scary, actually, when you said the guy who's got over 200,000 followers and he's saying such derogatory things about Hoy Lake. Uh, do you think it would be uh, better to actually have a, an amenity beach that's usable uh, for visitor numbers or uh, to have a salt marsh that no one can go on? To, to me, it's an absolute no-brainer. As a local resident, we, we have to have, I mean, that is our only amenity space. It's the space that visitors come to spend time on. It is it is absolutely vital to 
our lives to the quality of our lives, the people that live here, the people that pay council tax here, the people that cherish this town. And it's absolutely essential for business and the economy going on from these post-COVID times that we have a positive outlook for the future. And currently we don't have that, I'm afraid. I am very, very um, worried and upset and about what the future holds unless something is done about the, the current state of Hoylake Beach because people are not visiting my business as a direct result of what is happening to it currently. Thank you for that contribution. and um, It's really interesting to hear your views. Um, I don't see any more questions, um, so I'm going to move on to the second witness of Council Gardner's um, that's a Mr. David Gilbertson. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Okay. okay. Shall Did I go? Yeah. Please go ahead. Up to five minutes, please. Um, could you outline your statement? That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, my name is David Gilbertson. I have um, 20 seconds for um from from like from um, on, on the beach and um, i've lived here since uh the sort of mid 1980s um so i live on strand road which is a sort of midpoint um if you want that um, a reference between um the second part and the yeah, new light like station um so so i'm right on top of the of of, of this issue, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it uh, from day to day, um, and so understanding what, what happened. Um, Sorry, Mr. To interrupt you. The line is quite bad. Um, it's finding it difficult to to hear. You. Um, okay, I'll bring it a little bit closer. See if that helps. You still hear me? I think it's a bandwidth issue, not on mic. Can is everyone's? Can everyone just check? Um, every other counselor, uh, his mic is muted, and I'll just mute mine now. If we can try again, that'll be. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Any better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll just go through, very briefly go through again. Um, my name is David Gilbertson. Um, I live 20 metres um, just across the road, but from an hour um, off the beach, midpoint between. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilbertson. It's really difficult. It's happening again. What I'm going to do, um, okay. if you can hear me, is I think we can get one of our committee officers to dial you in. Um, yeah at some point so what i'll do is i'll just vary the order of witnesses if you don't mind go to someone else and then okay sure yeah we'll come back we'll come back oh, never mind okay, okay. Um, sorry about that if we if you can get someone to dial you in um i'll come back to you after the next witness okay okay um yeah. going to move then to um i've just lost uh so mr Charles Warren from Friends of Hoy Lake and West Kirby Beaches. Um, Mr. Warren. Mr. Warren's just disappeared. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good. Have you got me visually? Uh, I can't see at the moment, no, Mr. Warren. Um, but uh, would you like me to start? Yeah, you, you start if you can't if you can't if the camera's not working. Uh, I should press the logo in my uh, with my initials on, should I? Um, there's normally a camera button at the in the middle of it um, next to the time, but. It's not. It's not necessary, Mr. Warren. So, if, if you want to, uh, I yeah. think I've just come. I've just found it. Okay, we can see you now. That's brilliant. Uh, okay. Um, my name is Charlie Warren. I'm a chartered surveyor, civil engineering contractor, and as you say, a member of Friends of Hoylake and West Kirby Beach Committee. We have never heard of the Coastal Advisory Group, and we have not been consulted. I have lived in Hoylake most of my life 
Like 90% of Hoylake residents, I wish to see a flat sand. I wish to see the flat sandy beach conserved. Hoylake Beach comprises about 2% of a triple SI designated as an internationally important habitat for wading birds who feed on the invertebrates that they find under the surface of intertidal sand and mudflats. There is evidence, some published by Natural England in 2016, that Spartina grass expansion markedly reduces wading bird numbers. A decline has been reported in the most recent wetland bird survey. If left unchecked for even another season, the grass takeover that threatens the habitat will quickly become irreversible and impossible to restore economically. Soon, the Natural England and bird watchers will be lamenting the disappearance of Godwit, Dunlin and Knott. Then what we will say, what will we say we have done to conserve these species, that we've encouraged a salt marsh instead? We all have a statutory duty to conserve the habitat. Raking of the beach was agreed by Natural England as part of the current beach management plan. The new draft advice beach plan encourages the formation of embryonic sand dunes. This is misguided. The triple SI is not designed as a super tidal dune. We have expert advice from a director of an international firm of environmental consultants who lives locally, that dune formation would only happen if spring tides could no longer reach any emerging sand dunes. By this time, any dunes would have engulfed the highway. Have Wirral engineers been consulted about the dramatically increased cost of clearing the roads and the drainage issues? Has a study been made about the likely cost of compensation for lost property values? In fact, dune formation is highly unlikely for hundreds of years. Far more likely is the formation of an unattractive salt marsh similar to Parkgate. Those who want that only have to look beyond red rocks. What will this do for Hoylake's ambitions as an amenity beach resort? The council will no doubt be receiving complaints about flies, mosquitoes and health issues caused by the stagnant ponds that are already forming. We spent several days going door to door around Hoylake last summer, gathering signatures in support of spraying or raking. I can honestly say that about 90% supported conserving the sandy beach. Many of them said, unprompted, we don't want it looking like Parkgate. There was a little confusion regarding glyphosate, maybe 20% had reservations, but residents' views on the grass were crystal clear. These people are not ignorant, their opinions matter and should be respected. Unlike various minor celebrities, they are directly affected beach users. A door-to-door -door survey, in contrast to other methods, reveals the true nature and depth of public feeling. I also noticed that the minority anti-rake spray lobby were especially excitable, often engaging me for several minutes and trying to re-educate me. This characteristic has also been borne out at public meetings. There is a noisy, organised minority who want to change the views of the majority. There are some good things happening in Hoylake, but Hoylake Village Life's misguided vision of sand dunes and their false claim to represent the residents of Hoylake in connection with any new beach management plan are to be resisted. What should be done about it now? Natural England currently authorises the use of glyphosate, but this may be too controversial to use in the short term, other than spot spraying. You have already left it too late for regular beach raking to be effective. We suggest that a substantial trial section of amenity beach be authorised for power harrowing, such as that undertaken last week by Wirral contractors at Frank Beach Cemetery Extension. The most effective time to take action would be during the week before the next big equinox tides in mid-September. This should allow the tide to scour out the disturbed vegetation and reduce the chances of regrowth in the autumn. This must be done whilst it is still legal and before a new beach management plan, plan is agreed next year. 
if the harrowing experiment is effective, regular raking with the council's existing equipment may then be sufficient to deter the less invasive grasses. The solution to the pernicious Spartina problem is really only herbicide based, but a rotoberrying trial could be investigated. This has proved quite successful. Mr. Warren, sorry to interrupt you. Can, um, I've just been quite lenient with the five minutes, but can we just draw to a conclusion if, if, in the next minute? Two or three more sentences. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Political decisions are often about compromise. If you don't harrow the beach, you may please about 10% of Hoylake's minority and a few zealots. When we do harrow the beach, we will please about 90% of Hoylake's voters and conserve the habitat as legally required by natural England. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Warren, and thank you for your patience in joining us in that contribution. Uh, I'm going to open it up now to members questions um, should... so I've just raised my hand instead of looking for hand Council Cook uh, Council Chris Cook and then Councillor Johnson uh, thanks for your representation uh, Mr Warren yes um, there have been a few references to uh, the possible appearance of or oh, turning of Hoylet Beach into a salt marsh, uh, like in Parkgate, but but I think I've read uh, serious scientific views that it's unlikely that that would happen in Hoylet because it's not in an estuary like um, Parkgate. Um, would, would, would you have you any particular reason for believing that you know the eventual outcome is more likely to be a salt marsh than than uh, sand dunes? And the other thing you mentioned, um, wading birds might be under under threat. But uh, there is a view that, you know, if you allow, if you re reduce or eliminate uh, human intervention uh, in the beach, that would actually promote a wider biodiversity than we have at the moment. Yeah, more species rather than few species. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, the salt marsh is already forming. Um, the question is, will it become a salt marsh or a sand dune? And we don't believe it will become a sand dune. Uh, a sand dune will only establish uh, when the uh, new dune is out of the reach of the tide. Uh, and that doesn't appear to be happening. Our expert advice is it's not going to happen for hundreds of years. Uh, the salt marsh, it may not be the same as Parkgate, but it's already forming. It can be seen. Uh, as to wading birds, uh, I believe that they... Uh, they depend on invertebrates. I was actually looking at them this afternoon. Uh, they can't get the invertebrates through the grass. Uh, as the grass takes over, they drive the birds away. And this site is listed as an intertidal sand and mud flat to protect the wading birds. If you allow the grass to grow, you don't allow them to feed on the invertebrates. You drive them away. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, well, Councillor Cook, did you want to come back or? Yes, it's just that my question was not so much about the limited question of what happens to the wading birds feeding on invertebrates. It was, you know, had um, Mr. Warren considered the possibility of a wider biodiversity, you know, as a result of not non-intervention on, on the beach. That was really it. I haven't really considered it. It's des the citation, the triple SI uh, designation is as an intertidal mudflat and they list several species of birds, Dunlin, Knot, particularly bar-tailed Godwit. Uh, yes, of course, if the habitat changes, there will be biodiversity, you'll drive those birds away and you'll get other birds. But that's not what it's designated for. It's designated as its existing habitat, and we're required to conserve it, not to create biodiversity. Cool. Well, thanks for your answer anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Johnson next. Jenny? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
in, re in relation to that coastal advisory group, um, you say that you've not heard of it, and indeed we hadn't heard of it either. Um, you're in Friends of Hoylake and West Kirby Beaches, but it sounds like you haven't been consulted. So what do you think the Cabinet needs to do next, and indeed the committee needs to do next, to, co to consult with locality? Because what it seems to me is that really we are missing out on the locality and Councillor Gray is simply not listening to people like yourself who are incredibly well informed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Um, I, th I don't think the council need to listen to us at the moment. They just need to apply the existing beach management plan that's been agreed with Natural England. And before that expires, they should consult, and they should consult with stakeholders, including the Hoy Lake and West Kirby, friends of Hoylake and West Kirby Beaches, and indeed the wider residents of Hoylake. Uh, we haven't been consulted. I've never heard of the coastal the Coastal Advisory Group. I'm sorry, I can't hear Councillor Anderson. Sorry, that's my fault. I muted my microphone. <laughs> that um, I will move now to Councillor Musprat and then Councillor Cox. Christina. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Mr. Warren, uh, I'm a little bit confused with what you said um, as, as a self-confessed twitcher. When I look at the birds um, in that area, whilst you get the little plovers on the beach quite a lot, uh, were ex extremely um, interesting to watch. A lot of the birds are, are, are further down because it's the mud that they're uh, feeding on, isn't it? Which isn't near the grass. It's because, you know, the, the very nature of their long pointed beaks, that's what they're getting. They're getting the worms and all the other stuff out of uh, out of the mud. So w which birds, I'm, you, you've got me a bit worried now because I don't like to ever think that anything you do is going to affect the wonderful birds that we have in that area, the not are just so fantastic when you see them in flight. I mean, I could wax lyrical for hours on the birds in that area. But what's, what breeds specifically are you worried about? Um, because I never really noticed. I know, I know we've had things like the Wilson's Fowler Oak coming in from time to time, but that's a storm-driven thing, isn't it? Um, which birds on that stretch of beach are you worried about? Well, the... Um the uh, designation, the triple SI designation, actually names not Dunlin and Bartailed Godwit. Uh, not and Dunlin, uh, the numbers are reducing, but there's a lot of them. Bartailed Godwit mm. are quite rare. They're the most endangered of the three. They, they can move away. They can move away to non-grass areas, but they cannot feed on grass areas. And the designation for the whole of this beach is as uh, an intertidal flat for the protection of wading birds. It doesn't say anything about the formation of sand dunes. Uh, in fact, uh, we've talked about fines. I could see that the council could be vulnerable to fines for not conserving the habitat, allowing the grass to grow. It is actually destroying the habitat. By the way, I'm not a bird watcher, but uh, I like to see the habitat conserved. Can, can I just come back then and ask? Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I when, when, when I'm allowed to leave my house, which I hope will be fairly soon, because I've been in it since the end of February. Um, it, there are many areas that I go to where there are dunes and there are beaches and mudflats and the birds, and it doesn't seem to have affected them. Yes, the godwits, very much so, we want, we want to keep them. They are a rarity, um, and we're lucky. But obviously, with climate change, a lot of these birds are going to completely change their habits anyway. We've noticed this year that some species are a lot of, some don't need to come to us anymore. 
and I, I think that has to be taken into the equation. But I, I you know, I, I, I feel you, I can see that you genuinely are very concerned about the area you live in, which is something I share with the area I live in, which is central rural um, Clatterbridge area. So I understand that, but I, I'm just, I do feel that there's a place for everything there because I don't, I say the, be, the birds I normally see are the plovers and I don't think it would really affect them that much. Uh, I, I can see what you mean. Uh, yes, I'm all in favour of biodiversity and as the habitat changes, new species will come, the old species will go, but that is not what it's designated for. Uh, I haven't designated it, we haven't designated it. Uh, it's a statutory uh, body has designated as a triple SI and it's designated the habitat, it's designated the species. It hasn't said you can allow it to change. It doesn't matter if the birds go somewhere else. They haven't said uh, we want more biodiversity, we want different species in. They've listed, the, they've described the habitat and they've listed the species. And that's why it's conserved. It's not up to us to allow the habitat to change. Uh, it's, it's up to us to conserve it. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I've got a final question here from Councillor Cox. Tony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for your uh, input to speak. It was very interesting and enlightening as well, to say the least. Um, what I was going to say with regards to the Coastal Advisory Group, uh, you'll have heard that myself and my colleagues and as the Hoylake and Melts councillors were not have not been invited uh, or to even listen never, uh, as uh, observers, never mind their uh, inputs, not being experts, uh, of course. Um, but uh, clearly your knowledge um, with your experience and, and your group's experience uh, outweighs mine um, infinitely. Um, I just wanted to uh, see in, in the forthcoming consultation, which I'm hoping one way or another, regardless of what I move or whether the uh, decision, uh, the cabinet decision is upheld, there will be some sort of consultation, hopefully a, a genuine one. Um, would you be uh, interested or do you think your group would be interested in being part of the uh, consultees? And if that's not uh, as a whole group, even uh, co-opted onto the advisory group, would that be something that you'll think, uh, think your group will be interested in? I'm sure it would. Uh, we'd very much like to be consulted. Uh, I like to think having done a, uh, an extensive walk around Hoylake and gathered petitions, I really have got the feeling of the public, as you have. Uh, I, I think um, it's been said several times this afternoon that 90% of the locals want a sandy beach. Uh, some of them have reservations about glyphosate, uh, but 90% of them want a sandy beach. And we would be very pleased to join any advisory group or be part of any con consultation, but we haven't been asked yet. Thank you, Mr. Wadden, Charlie. Thanks for that. It was just to ensure that it's on record and we ensure that all parties who are interested actually get a say. The last thing I'd want is for anyone to believe that the consultation was a complete sham and we just carried out what we intended doing from the uh, the, the, the outset. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, look, Mr. Warren, thank you very much for your contribution and your time this evening. It's much appreciated. Um, I'm going to move now back to... Mr. Gilbertson, I believe we're on the line. Uh, are you there? Well, I am. Can Brilliant. you hear me? I can, loud and clear. So, okay, uh, well, I'm going to leave the camera off. Um, apparently, sure. is helped. So, um, I shall leave it at that. Um, shall I continue? Please, yeah, up to five minutes, Mr. Gilbertson. Okay. So, um, I start off by saying, just um, trying to explain that my location and um, where I am, where I live and have done for um, 30 uh, plus years since the mid 80s. Um, Sorry, the Gilbert, the, the line keeps going um, funny. Have you got a number to dial in? Were you given a number to dial in? I can dial in, yeah. yeah I've I, got the number to hand. Sorry. What I propose then is if we take a five minute comfort break and um, okay. we've been going two and a half hours. So 
um, if members can leave, uh, not leave the meeting, but you know, switch microphones and cameras off, and we'll resume the meeting at, um, at eighteen thirty-eight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I make that five minutes. Um, are you back with us, Mr. Gilbertson? Okay, we'll just give it another minute. Hello, can you hear me now? Hey, we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilbertson. A third time lucky. Um, so we'll resume the meeting, and if you can try again with your statement, I'd be most grateful. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, fairness, I'm probably going to reiterate um, some of what's already been said um, by Nicola um, and by Mr. Warren. Um, well, that, that uh, probably... Um, speak to itself in a sense. But what I did want to do was sort of tell my story of how I've managed to be part of this meeting today, um, which is growing out of a little protest group based in Holy Lake um, with some friends or people I've met. Mr. Gilbert, um, my profusion, the, the, the line is just merging. Um, is this the same for every other member? Um, or can someone just confirm? Yes, so. It's, it's, okay. Um, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. It's just about intelligible, I would say. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a Mr. Gilbertson, have you been given a phone number you can dial into with a pin? Yeah, I'm going to try that now. Okay. Um, what I'll do is just we'll just pause then for another two minutes, if members will allow, and just to try Mr. Gilbertson so he can dial in via a phone line. Hello, Mr. Gilbertson. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Far away. Okay. So, um, th th this is uh, what, what I was attempting to say, um, but I just wanted to explain. I think I need yep. to, uh, to, to, to mute my laptop speaker now. Okay. So, I was attempting to say. <laughs> Um, I want to explain um, why, why I'm in front of you today and, and, and sort of what that, um, the process and, and, and journey has been and that I've got involved at sort of community level in protesting and querying and researching what's going on with the beach. Um, very briefly again, uh, I've lived here since 1986. I live 20 metres from the beach in one of the old towns, Victorian roads. So I'm really on top of, of, of what uh, of the beach and probably because I work from home for an hour to hour, day to day, I'm, I'm observing what's going on. And, um, that's sort of a uh, upset and distress and disdain for the, what, what I now know is sort of become a uh, council policy with regard to maintaining the beach and um, led to involvement with, the, with uh, this local group. Um, I've attempted to engage with Councillor Gray uh, and, and 
gain her thoughts on the matter. She's the environment councillor. Um, she really, I would, would, would kind of say she didn't really want to do that. Uh, I, I request a meeting. Uh, that was denied. Um, I'm a Labour Party member as well, I should add, and, um, and it was disappointed from, from that point of view. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, research and trying to find out uh, what the problems with the beach were, such that we'd have this policy, um, I've been to the council, I've freedom of information request, uh, measurements that were taken with regards to the beach, because we're hearing a lot about sand accretion. Um, and how sand levels are rising, but to my surprise, really, um, that didn't turn out to be particularly true. I don't think I can show you the the, the um, images I have now for the situation with the camera. Um, but um, as um, and the gardeners' uh, historical pictures show, and 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 as anyone can uh, go and find out with a simple Google search on these historical pictures of, of Holly Lake Beach, the sand levels aren't really showing much change at all. In some areas, there's uh, the sand levels are lowered quite significantly. Um, in other areas, uh, they're reasonably level. And of course, it's a dynamic beach, a big gust of wind um, really, really changes what happens on the beach. Um, across a um, few day, we, we get a... Um, a change in weather, um, and that affects the tide, that affects the winds, and that affects the beach. So, so it, it is with with a uh, disbelief, but I accept that that much is changing down there. Um, so, I'd like to just um, sort of talk um, a little bit more about the petition um, that I put online. That as of today, I think. 2,949 people signed, and that was really to uh, continue to rake the beach and maintain the beach, short of using um, the weed killer, the glyphosate. Um, I'm, I was going to read some comments out um, that are from local people uh, that they've, when they've signed the petition, um, they left comments. Um, it, it's the sort of thing, sort of um, slightly disgruntled, annoyed uh, feedback that you might expect. Disgusting mess. The beach will be lost forever, just like Park Gate. The beach is an eyesore. Most of the beach is now oily, muddy filth, mixed with litter and grass. It's a health hazard. Uh, and the bite my daughter and I have suffered this year is unacceptable. I live here, this comment is. The flies are an absolute disgrace. The beach, unless you walk far out, is revolting. You can't sit near the front for being bitten and the beach is not being cleaned. Um, so there's lots and lots of comments like that. Uh, um, and people are rightly frustrated, disgruntled, fed up with inertia um, and nothing being done um, about a beach that's now been neglected for two years with this grass going on it. Um, that's, that's unusable as an immunity beach. We've had no end of activities on the beach that now cannot continue uh, because the grass is grown. Um, so in terms of, of numbers and the strength of feeling in Lake, I can only reiterate what's had been said before. It appears to be a majority of people um, are deeply dissatisfied um, with the council policy. Um, with regard to what's going on now and what happens, um, we're now going to have sort of autumn and winter tides that are going to destroy the grass that's grown and it will go back to a sandy beach. And that happens every winter. Um, we get these big, bigger tides uh, that, that, that sort of wash the beach, I, I suppose. Um, so, so, so it seems to have a real impact, impact with it. Um, and this is why it's all come, come to a head. Uh, so uh, just a quick um, reiteration of some of the groups um, and associations and various people that have expressed sympathy with, with what the petition uh, asks for, um, which specifically, just in case anyone hasn't seen it or isn't aware, is if the beach to be raked and maintained without the use of glyphosate. So those groups would be specifically Sailing Club at Oilake, 
uh, senior members at the RNLI. We've had people on, I've had people on horses feed back to me, horse riders. They're unhappy with the state of the beach. We had a volleyball club down there that's no longer used the beach. People fishing uh, aren't happy about, about the state of the beach. There are wakeboarders, tank servers, wind servers, board servers of all kinds. Surfers against sewage have expressed some sympathy uh, with, with the situation. And of course, there's no end of dog walkers and beach visitors and bird watchers and joggers and runners and people enjoying the day out um, that, that are struggling to do that. I think what, what, what really um, just disappointed me, um, I may have been sort of tipping point where I feel I'm going to get a little bit more active and do something about all this. Is this walking the dog down there uh, one sunny day, this would be last summer. Um, and a family who were visiting the day with a few deck chairs and a couple of uh, two or three little ones and what appeared to be grandma and granddad who up sticks and left the beach because, it, um, and to quote, quote directly, you know, they found it, I think the word was useless. This beach is useless. Covered in grass, covered in slime, can't use the beach. Um, and, and so off they told, they packed up and, and left. And that's just really disappointing. Uh, can I ask you to wrap up, please? But thank you. You can you certainly yes. Yeah. So in just signing off, I'm gonna say I'm a Labour Party member, I'm a former Greenpeace member, I've been a member of Friends of the Earth, um, I've campaigned against anti apartheid, I'm a former union rep and socialist youth campaigner. So I appreciate all the arguments about about what's happening. I'm aware of, of the situation we're in, environment, socially, economically and so on. But but I don't really feel um, that not maintaining the beach as we had it for a long, 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 long time um, is going to resolve those issues, but, but it is going to betray public residents without a doubt. And thanks for listening. No, uh, thank you for your perseverance and your contribution and patience as well. I'm going to open okay. up now to uh, members to ask questions. Um, so if you just wait one second while I see the hands go up. And I've done it again, raise my hand. Um, I'll, well, I'll start with, with, with a question. Um, I understand you're part of the um, Love Hoy Lake group. I'm just wondering if you've had any um, consultation um, from anyone in the council regarding the beach management? Yeah, um, um, some email exchanges with um, Councillor Gray. Um, I requested a meeting, should we meet about it and talk, um, and find out further about policy, but, but that was um, turned down, too busy and so on. Um, and, and of course, through this um, Love Hoy Lake group that's been established by, by friends that live in Hoy Lake, um, I've, I've met on, on a few occasions uh, our, our ward councillors, Okay. No, that. Thank you. Do any members have any other questions? Councillor Cox. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Um, Dave, this is just a, a, a quite simple one. This really, um, I think Councillor Gray. Well, she didn't even intimate. She actually stated that it had been politicised uh, by ourselves uh, as your ward councillors, and I, I think. Um, is it reasonable for, for me to say, because we've been engaging with yourselves and many others for, for months on end now, that we have tried to do as best as we can the polar opposites to what Councillor Gray is doing? For some reason, she seems to think this is like our idea, uh, which is exactly what she said in the Echo uh, last week, uh, on Wednesday rather. Um, and somehow we're uh, looking for supporters to back us when it's the it's actually the polar opposite. You, you said you're a, you're a card carrying Labour member. This has got no reference whatsoever to uh, party political um, ideology. This is all to do with listening uh, to the dem democratic voice of the people of Hoylake. Do you think that's reasonable? I do think that's very reasonable. The last email I sent to Liz Gray uh, basically was two sentences. Um, well, it was a bit of a shout, really. You know, you're not listening. It basically said, you're not listening. And I have to say, there's, there's two or three groups um, that, that are, that are um, pro maintaining um, an amenity beach in Hoylake. So, so that that kind of answers your question, really. It's as simple as that. Um, okay. Um, 
I don't see any more questions for Mr Gilbertson, so um, thank you for your contribution. I'm thank now you. going to move on to evidence from the decision takers, witnesses, that's Councillor Grays. Um, I'm going to ask Dr Alan Jemmett to come forward. He's Director of Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service. Are you there, Dr Jemmett? I am indeed. I've just turned the camera on. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I think it's obviously going to be quite a long evening for people. I'm, I, as, I'm giving evidence as the Director of Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service. We are the Council's Environmental Advisor on a whole range of things. I'm also a local resident of Hoy Lake, having lived here for 15 years, and I use the coast on a daily basis. I'm a qualified coastal ecologist and marine biologist, have a PhD um, on the Mersey Estuary, so I was formerly the manager for the de Estuary, and I've got over three, um, 30 years professional environmental experience, uh, much of it actually in the local area. So what I'd like to do over the next five minutes is just provide a little bit of evidence um, in support of the Cabinet members' decisions. I think the, the first point which has already been discussed this evening is yes, we are dealing with complex systems driven by natural processes that shape the coast and coasts change, they're dynamic, the habitats are, are dynamic, the nature conservation interests are also dynamic and the nature conservation um, designations um, do need to respond to natural change. The change that's taking place along Hoy Lake is, um, has been ongoing for a long period of time. There's, there's little doubt that in recent years the beach levels have been rising and we know where that sound's coming from. It's coming from offshore sources and um, the, the council monitoring data does show that we've got that trend. The result is that the upper beach along the promenade is higher and drier and that's resulting in more issues with wind blow sand. Um, but also things such as Les Bartina grass in those lower areas. There's been quite a bit of um, discussion about where the beach begins and starts, and the location mean high water spring does change. It changes over time depending on where the beach levels are, so it moves backwards and forwards, forwards spatially. So at any one point in time, it's quite difficult to actually say precisely where it is. What we do know is that the beach and the upper beach does get influenced by um, tidal inundation, particularly at low pressure under large storms. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens about one o'clock tomorrow morning with a 10 metre tide we've got and the current weather conditions. It'd be interesting to see how far um, the water comes up. Rising beach levels have pros and cons. Um, they can Rising beach levels can improve um, coast protection and flood defence, but they also create sand management issues. So there are pros and cons in any, any, any approach that needs to be taken. It must also be remembered that we're not dealing with an undisturbed system. It has been um, interfered with um, for a long period of time. Now, um, that's understandable. Um, there, there is a beach management plan in, in, in place and the, the raking and the spraying has actually slowed down some of the natural processes that might be taking place. We must remember that vegetation is actually quite good at um, trapping wind blowers. Natural England's recent advice is quite categoric in, in as much as they're not going to reassent, they're not going to approve um, the existing status quo moving forward. Therefore, the council has little choice but to look at finding an alternative, more sustainable solution. So the, the overall approach about looking at evidence space or beach management strategy is absolutely the right way forward. My second point is, is, is related to evidence, which is we need good quality evidence and data to inform future management of the beach and establish a baseline. We can't rely on preconceived views or opinions. We need the data and the evidence. And, and I think the, the Cabinet members' recommendations are very clear from that point of view. I think persisting with the current approach is going to be expensive, it's going to continue to create conflict, and perhaps will lead to some un unintended consequences. There is, there is a viewpoint that some of the management operations are actually making the position worse in terms of 
some of the grasses that it's actually seeking to eradicate, such as Spartina and Poxinellia. Poxinellia. So actually what we do need is good data and evidence that can be independently reviewed by appropriately qualified people, but people who have been openly and transparently appointed by the council. My third point is, is, is again quite a simple one, which is we need an integrated set of solutions that look at the whole coast, but actually look at the whole beach and the whole beach area from the prom down to low water mark. And we need to separate out some of the issues. So we need to separate out what's happening with the natural vegetation succession a little bit further down the beach compared to some of the issues that we've got, which are a direct consequence of the drainage issues. My fourth point is that we need a long term approach and we need a commitment to monitoring, reporting and adjusting our management according to what the evidence shows. And driving that has to be good knowledge and understanding of what's happening with the physical processes. My fifth point, and it's one that's been made by, I think, every single person this evening, is that the local community care, and they absolutely love their beach. And the changes are understandably raising questions and, and, and issues. I think it's also fair to observe that some of the, the, the well-intentioned local actions um, in recent years have perhaps um, created some ill-advised and unintended consequences um, because some of, the, some of the vegetation doesn't actually respond particularly well to being dug up and chopped around. It can actually uh, make the situation worse. So what we actually need is a positive con conversation. We need to help engage the community in this so that they can assist. And my final point, and just finishing off now, Chair, is that the beach is a very large area. I think it's entirely possible to work with nature and maintain open, open sandier areas for amenity with an amenity focus. The space for nature, the space for a whole range of different activities and access on the beach. There's a way that we can actually work together to find a long term solution but we need a long-term commitment to data and evidence gathering to inform that. Thanks very much. Thank you, and thank you for your contribution to the committee tonight. Um, I'm going to open it up now to members' questions. Um, in order, I've got um, Councillor Alan Brain and then Councillor Cox. Alan? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Gemmers. Uh, could I ask, are, are you the, the uh, A. Gemmers, who was one of the authors of the report commissioned by the Council in year 2000? That is correct, yes. Uh, as far as I know, that, that report never saw the light of day. I mean, do, do, do you know why it was suppressed or nothing came of it? Well, I wouldn't um, suggest that it's been suppressed. Um, what I would say is that um, we need a commitment to actually monitoring, acting on evidence and moving things forward if we are going to have a more sustainable solution. Thank you. The, the, we saw earlier, uh, uh, pro probably you were watching, uh, uh, Councillor Gardner showed some photographs, uh, including uh, one from probably the 1950s of the sand right up to the uh, the wall at, uh, at the beach, and yet you said the, the beach level has been rising. I mean, it, how, how do you justify that, that statement in, in view of the beach? Yeah, sure, sure. I did qualify it by saying um, rising in recent years. So what we actually need to do is look at a long time series of data and actually fully understand what's happening from a geomorphological point of view, which again points to the Cabinet members' recommendations about independent evidence-based studies. That's actually what we need to actually inform the, the approach moving forward. Okay, thank you. Well, one final question, if I may. Um, you, you said in your final point that we, you thought we could maintain some area of uh, amenity, Sandy Beach. Uh, how would we actually do that without raking or using uh, herbicides? I think there's a number of options and that's that's what part of this needs to look at. But there are a range of what well known techniques which you which can actually um, establish and trap sand, manage habitats and actually maintain and to keep some areas clear. So there's a there's a range of different techniques that can be utilized. And I'm not saying 
uh, one or the other. It might be that you do need some mechanical cleaning in, in, in some areas to help maintain some of that amenity. Um, but we need to test and trial things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Councillor Cox, you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just the, the, the last comment that you uh, said there, Dr. Gemma, to find it quite uh, interesting that we need to test and trial things. That's exactly what I would have suggested uh, before uh, actually uh, making cabinet decisions, but that's that's just how I would have done things, but never mind. Um, two <laughs> topics. The first one is um, uh, on sand accretion. Um, so you will have heard my colleague, Councillor Gardner, in his opening remarks talk about um, and 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 reference council data, which you may well have had some input into, um, that uh, there are various areas within the beach that are actually not, uh, 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 there isn't sand accretion taking place, it's actually now subsiding. In fact, in the Natural England report, uh, which uh, again, I, I spoke earlier about, the last time there was a full nat Natural England um, uh, uh, evaluation carried out, it was 2012, so it's not actually recent data at all, it's quite old data. Um, and even in that uh, particular report, it states that uh, while sand accretion has been taking place, uh, they believe it may have found, I think the word is equilibrium now. Um, so, uh, th and this is back in 2012, uh, they believed it found equilibrium and may uh, going forward start to subside. So I think the first, some of the decisions have been based purely around or some of the, uh, uh, the uh, talking heads have gone on continually about uh, sand accretion when we don't actually know if sand accretion has taken place or not. Maybe you could clarify that one for me. And the, 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 other, the other issue is, um, if, I can, if I can find my questions, bear with me. Uh, right, so this is again to do with um, the supertidal and intertidal. So uh, I, I put it twice to Councillor Gray and she clearly didn't like uh, what I was saying. Um, maybe you, as as you know, one and uh, uh, one of our experts uh, can clarify for me what would constitute the supratidal area on the beach. Now, I, as a lay person and a, a non-degree level ecology expert, um, I would suggest reading the internet, um, uh, uh, which I am capable of doing, uh, that the the area where the beach uh, uh, is actually accumulating grass, which is the bit that um, does not come into contact with high tide except when there are storms, prevailing winds, uh, et cetera. And it, it is effectively a splash zone. So that is the super, uh, super tidal area. So can you define for me and then uh, specifically state whether you believe the grass is actually in the uh, intertidal area or the su super tidal area, please? Okay. Um, the, 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 the first one there about um, accretion, I think, you know, as I said in my evidence, coast change, that's that's the first thing. And you get periods of accretion, you get periods of erosion. You also in Liverpool Bay, you do get a movement of, of material along along the coast. So you do get sort of periodic changes. What you need to look at is what's actually happening over a slightly longer time series. And that's 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 the key observation, really, because you're always going to get things such as the high winds and storms that we we might experience tonight might create some localized erosion, but it comes back. But the evidence is showing that there is long term accretion on along the coast. If you look at the time series since 2000 in terms of the um, the slides, um, that council councillor Gardner actually. Um, put up, but the key, the key thing is you need, and, and it, you really do need a long-term time series and evidence-based study to actually form a view on on the evolution of the coast. And in fact, that's you know one of the recommendations within the cabinet members' report. So you're actually voting for you know that that particular recommendation, which is independent scientific review. I think in terms of the supratidal, um, intertidal, sublittoral area, uh, as I, as I said in my, my my evidence, the the mean high water spring mark doesn't does move. It will move in up and down the beach according to those beach levels. So it's very difficult to precisely define exactly where it is at any one point in time. 
the what you currently have on the beach with the, the vegetation is that you've got the what you could say is is a mixture between a succession between open sand going towards embryo dune type habitats which is influenced occasionally by tidal inundation so what i mean that by that are the higher tides to spring tides and then when you get low pressure and storm events that water will come up further and that's the, your super literal which you're referring to which is the splash zone yeah if i can do it chair it, it's starting to push you on this you see the, the points that i'm i'm just, getting at doctor can i just ask sorry if we've got multiple or oh, this goes for every member because it's interesting to hear the answer we've got multiple questions can we just ask them once and i'll bring you know just one question at a time and i'll bring Bring you back. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back in if you like. It's uh, yeah, it, it's it, it's directly related to that. Though. That's the thing. It, it, it's, yeah, it's up to you. I can come back in. No, what I mean is not ask multiple questions, like four or five or six questions, because this is quite <laughs> complicated. If we just ask one at a time, and then. Oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, th th this is just one. Um, just to push you again directly on that. You see, whilst I understand there are lots of views here about what the beach should be. Uh, we, we know what it currently is designated as. Uh, I, it's pretty clear from some of the questions and some of the comments what people would like to see it as, uh, which is not what it's designated as at the minute. Um, what I'm trying to get at is, um, and it, it's, it's, it's quite simple you know, to throw it on uh, uh, hands in the air. Um, I don't believe uh, the report that we are actually basing everything on states that we cannot rake the area that I'm referring to. Regardless of what we would like to see, or certain individuals would like to see, or certain groups would like to see for that matter, um, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I want to know, is the area that I'm referring to, which is where the grass is currently forming, which is up against the tidal wall, is that in the super, uh, uh, super tidal area? Because if that, And I believe it is. And if that's what it is, um, then the whole debate that we're having is null and void anyway because everything is based around the intertidal on that report from that England. everything it does not mention that area not once so i can't believe that they were being competent enough not to mention it so it can only be that it doesn't actually feature in that particular report therefore there is nothing stopping us raking that area with beach that's my point what I, what i will say in, in response is when you you need to look at the the boundaries of the designated sites and when you look at things such as special protection area it comes up very close to the seawall so it's 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 you know that that is a line drawn on the map and that is you know factually where the designated site is and that is a proxy for the intertidal area well that, that that's the exact point isn't it it's it's almost up to the wall and it's almost where the grass is but it's not exactly up to the wall and over where the grass is which would be pretty if if natural england said to me right this second you cannot rake any of that beach ever that's the end of it. And it's pretty much the end of it but my, the point i've maintained throughout whilst being completely dismissed uh, by the cabinet member is that they have not said that in any way shape or form and when you scrutinize the actual uh, documents it does not say anything about that particular zone so regardless of where the ssi might suggest it goes up to if it goes up to the seawall it's job done isn't it if, it, if that is classed as the intertidal zone it's job done but it doesn't it does not state that in, in, and anything you've just said there sounds like obfuscation if, 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 if it'd be so kind to say okay well i mean i think the way i'd res respond to that is um I, I don't really follow your you, the, the the train of um, logic between what what you're stating and the reasons for the call in. So I'm, I'm struggling to to, to follow um, the, the the point that you're actually making because the call in was for particular reasons, and this seems to be an issue that you're looking for an answer on. And you know it can be looked at in terms of a precise definition but that precise definition will only be a de definition at any single point in time because coasts are dynamic and they move and that includes the mean high water mark well, well we're clearly not going to clear that one up tonight but thank you for your input anyway okay i'm going to move now to i've got councillor johnson and then councillor cook so jenny thank you thank you thank you, thank you Dr. 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 
you've got experience there working five years it looks like with Wirral Council and then now you're working with many other councils I'm just having a look at your background there why should we not continue with our strategy of raking that short term we've not been prevented to do so by natural England if it's allowed to carry on for much longer be it another year 18 months you you know that will change substantially why can we not to have a short-term strategy which is continue with what we've been doing not with the actual chemicals etc we've agreed on that but in relation to raking and then longer term we're looking at a concentration consultation and a strategy um, and involving people like yourself I'm sure to advise on that which makes perfect sense but why can't we have a short-term strategy which gives us immunity beach back for our locality and then be looking at something longer term at the same time please thank you okay i think there's the, there's a number of things that the, the 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 first one i would 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 just flag is that um by not raking at this moment in time we are moving towards a more um representative baseline um position can people still hear me because the, my screen's yeah, changed? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just I'm just checking. So, so the first thing is just about baseline. It's a ba about baseline because it hasn't been raked for a period of time. We're getting closer to a more natural baseline situation, which is scientifically a good place to start in terms of establishing that baseline and being able to. Uh, determine what's happening in terms of studies, evidence, evolution of, of, of the coast. Uh, in terms of whether or not um, rate, raking could continue, I believe, um, you know, the ascent from Natural England um, runs out at the end of March next year. So there's a, there's a time limited period. That's not a decision that um, you know, I, I, I can make and until things such as the Coastal Advisory Group has been formally constituted, um, th you know, through, through, through the Council, we are where we are. Can I just come back on that then? So to clarify then, we can rake now until the end of March. And so we are allowed by Natural England to do so. So my question, and I, and I and this, there must be some way, I'm going to make sure Paul Sator listens to this, the Chief Executive listens to this, there must be a way of us being able to rake that land, that, rake the, that, that beach now, getting it back so we've got some amenity beach for our locality, and then longer term looking at this. And I would say as well, we can look at any issue, any problem with the lens that we've been brought with. So you've got very much an ecological, geological lens and you're viewing it through that lens if we had someone alongside you with a business lens they would see it differently as we've heard before somebody else with um, just a local lens a family or a, or a dog owner you, you lots of different lenses so whenever we set up an advisory group we surely should get people from opposing positions and very different ways of seeing seeing the world otherwise if we pick people just from this one perspective particularly then I think we are in danger of not being representative so part of it's ecological but part of it's far more than that it's about our community about our businesses about our area it's not just about our area of speciality and I'm an academia so I can completely relate to having a an, an academic subject and an academic area that we're interested in yeah. but what I'm saying is we need surely people from different lenses and different views thank you I think there's 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 two things. The first one is you need an integrated approach um, to the solution. I've already made that point in my my evidence, and that includes a range of perspectives, but it also includes looking at Hoy Lake um, within the wider the, the wider um, coast coastal system. In terms of raking, the uh, you know I'm talking in support of the the cabinet members. Um, decision and actually think um, pausing at this moment in time is a very sensible thing to do because it does enable the baseline to be established and in independent work to, mo to move forward but that is not a decision I can make. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got um, three more questions. Um, can, I'm just conscious of time. I don't want to stifle debate or contributions but if members can keep the question succinct, brief to the point, and then the answers will be um, extremely useful. So I've got Councillor Cook, then Councillor Cameron, and then Councillor Collins. Chris. Okay, thanks so much, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Dr Gemma, thanks very much for the information put across so far. I'd like to return it back to the long-term ecological perspective of a possible can. Uh, I've taken school trips to France, Normandy, France, where one of the chief attractions has been the sand dunes you know we, they were pointed out to, to us by our hosts and um, I've heard this business about sand accretion and I believe that sand dunes are one form of that um, could you uh, explain uh, 
could he confirm the likelihood of sand dunes eventually forming if raking doesn't take place and over what time period and one thing we haven't talked much about perhaps enough today is is the issue of um sea defenses you know do, do they have a, a role potentially in, in in protecting the coast i'll leave you to that thanks okay uh, I'll, t- I'll take your last point first i mean yeah i mean an increasing beach level means that there will be less less energy getting to the coast defenses which is good news in terms of um, coast and flood protection so that's the first thing so increasing beach levels is is a significant benefit and also uh, you know natural habitats are also very good at absorbing the energy um, from, from the sea so all of that is a very positive response to um, to some of the challenges of climate change and increasing um, water levels and increased storminess. In terms of exactly what it looks like, I haven't got a crystal ball. I can't actually tell you precisely what it's going to look like, how quickly that's going to take place and where it's going to take place. I think we're getting a fairly good idea of some of the potential futures when you look at some of the areas that have been changing um, on, on, on the beach. You just look at um, and some of the lime grass and uh, marron grass have started to develop in just one or two very restricted areas. So I suspect, and it's only a suspicion, that we would start to get some small sand hummocks forming, which would be the start of some embryo June. Precisely what that would look like over a longer term period in terms of the succession is difficult to predict with certainty and without scientific evidence. But having said that, you can look at other parts of the open coast in the northwest and get a fairly good a fairly good idea of what the future might look like. And you know, there's no reason why um, interested members can take a trip up to certain parts of the Sefton coast. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Councillor Cameron, Helen? You're still muted, Helen. Sorry. Um, you mentioned the Sefton Coast, um, and obviously we've made reference to Park Gate previously. Um, have you studied what's happening in the bay? Because obviously with the Burbo Bank wind farm, there's a lot of drilling, a lot of concrete poured. Um, Hoyle Bank has changed for sure. And now we're dredging the Mersey and talk about a a tidal uh, barrier as well um, and Parkgate wasn't entirely natural that was exacerbated by dredging on the Welsh side are we looking at a much wider area than this little corner because um, <laughs> the studies you must you must be studying the entire bay um, although all of our attention is on this little bit of beach that could be a nice amenity beach mm. Well, I'm not personally <laughs> studying the entire uh, Liverpool Bay, but there's clearly a range of different data sources that can come in and actually help for, for, form views. And again, that's one of the reasons why independent scientific evidence and, and, and research is needed. And that's where things such as the hydrodynamics studies actually come into this. It's interesting that we've had um, Parkgate mentioned a number of times this evening, and the point's already been made that um, Parkgate is not Hoy Lake, Hoy Lake is not Parkgate. You know, Hoy Lake is part of Open Coast. Parkgate is a long way um, up an estuary. So they are very different situations and they have very different drivers of the physical processes. Uh, so absolutely, any any study does need to take account of and utilise all the available evidence to actually help um, come to a scientific consensus. Thank you. So had, had you ever advised uh, Councillor Gray to pause the raking? Did you do that in 2019 or this group that's not constituted yet? Did you advise? 
no, I, th I think I haven't. Um, I haven't sort of formally advised on on anything in terms of this. I have attended, um, you know, meetings of, of of the coastal advisory group in terms of you know discussing whether the coastal advisory group um, should be set up and discussing some of those issues. But it isn't, to my my knowledge, formally set up and doesn't have a formal role yet. What I would say is it's absolutely something that is needed to actually help provide that independent um, scientific advice and oversight and um, just to pick up on some of you know some of the other issues this isn't about um, people having um, preconceived views it's about letting the data and the evidence drive the beach management strategy and the wider coastal strategy moving forward so, so you were never in a meeting where the advice was to halt, immediately halt all the raking uh, prior to even 2020 starting? I haven't been in it. I haven't been in a meeting where a decision has been taken to, to, to that effect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, final question from Councillor Collins, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, we're talking of a quite a small area which is designated as an amenity beach. Now, I believe that we could be able to get on with the raking, but what I'm asking, can the research that you suggest that is needed be done uh, or be uh, an, another area of beach be used as that to find that information, uh, get that research done while we still have that amenity beach? Um, is there a way of doing that without... Uh, if you see what I'm saying, I'm, I'm not a researcher, so I don't know whether you can you have to have a specific area or can you look at further up the coast or further down the coast for, for research? Mm. I think um, I can't really answer that. What I would say is you would need to define your your, your research area and your methods. And, you, and so you'd adopt an intelligent approach to, to that, to, you know, to actually find the most representative way to do things. Right. OK, thank you. OK, I um, see Helen's hand still up, but I think that was from a previous question. Um, yes, so, um, well, thank you, Dr. Jimmett, for your time and your contribution this evening. It's much appreciated. I'll move on to the second witness from the decision taker. Um, that's David Parker, who is chair of the DSG conservation group uh are you there mr parker yes yes i am uh, uh here and uh thank you thank you for the opportunity this evening um yeah my name is dr day i'm a doctor as well david dr david oh, parker that, uh, it's all right um and i'm a chartered ecologist with um, a 40-year career working in environmental consultancy and for government agencies most recently as chief scientist of the countryside council for wales so my expertise is in ecology and environmental management, uh, habitat restoration and uh, environmental governance. And I knew a fair bit about, about birds as well. I've lived on the Wirral since 1977 and in West Kirby for 30, 33 years. So my current roles include chair of the Natural Environment Advisory Group of the National Trust, which, which operates in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I'm chair of the Deestry Conservation Group, a local charity established in 1975 to further the sustainable management of the de estuary, both for people and wildlife. So firstly, I would like to say that Hoylake Beach is part of a legally protected coastal environment under a number of UK statutes, including the Wildlife and Countryside Act, uh, the Habitats and Species Regulations, and that Wirral Borough Council has a key statutory role in applying and enforcing this legislation. The Council also has a statutory duty under the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act to conserve biodiversity. And this legislation will still be in force following the UK leaving the EU in December. And UK and Welsh, UK and Welsh governments have indicated that such protection will be at least retained and probably enhanced, not least in responding to the twin threats of climate change and the continuing loss of the UK's biodiversity. And Wirral Council acknowledged an environment and climate emergency on the 15th of July last year and has therefore committed to acknowledge and take action on these in all its decisions. So 
there's a re as Alan has said, there's a really strong need for an integrated approach to the management of Hoylake Beach. And in order to draw the evidence base together to do this, it is necessary to pause the active management of the beach so that these baseline conditions are set. So we've heard about four main factors here, the continuing beach accretion re resulting in a rising beach and the development of sand dune and salt marsh vegetation through natural processes. Secondly, the development of vegetation on the top of the beach by the promenade, likely due to polluted drainage water. Now that is distinct from the development of sand dune and salt marsh vegetation on the wider beach and that has been covered this evening. Thirdly, climate change resulting in sea level rise and the increasing intensity of storm events, raising the importance of sustainable coast protection. Fourthly, the concerns of the local community. But Hoylake Beach is not alone. Communities across the UK have similar concerns about coastal change and coast protection. So there's an imperative need to plan beyond the short term and produce a coastal management plan for Hoylake Beach Looking 50 to 100 years ahead for low-lying coastal sites is becoming the norm. For example, the National Trust, which owns 780 miles of coastline, is developing 50 to 100 year plans for all of its coastal properties, starting with those at most at risk from the impacts of climate change and natural coastal processes. These are all being developed with local communities, together with local authorities and regulators, and are all evidence-based requiring the collation of existing data, but also the commissioning of new studies. All this takes time, patience and community engagement in both the process and in the development of future plans. At Hoylake, there is an urgent need for the current shoreline management plan, which covers Hoylake Beach, to be outdated as part of this process. The Natural England advice to Wirral Council regarding beach management from March is in accord with current thinking that we should be more accepting of natural process in co processes in coastal management planning, working with and not against nature. Due to the open sea shoreline at Hoylake, current evidence suggests that the natural development of sand dune salt marsh vegetation at Hoylake Beach will proceed as it's currently taking place at Birkdale on the Sefton coast, where sand dunes are the most prominent feature. Oil Lake Beach cannot be compared to Parkgate, we've heard this, where coastal processes are different in a sheltered estuarine, estuarine environment. Natural England has also confirmed that they will not reassent current management practices at Oil Lake Beach when the current ascent ends on the 31st of March 2021. New thinking and planning are therefore needed. So my conclusion Working with natural processes and long-term planning provides an opportunity for Hoy Lake Beach. Firstly, to be increasingly better protected from the impacts of sea level rise and increasing intensity of storms caused by climate change. Secondly, to support increased biodiversity through the development of new coastal habitats, as well as maintaining existing wildlife values for which the area is statutorily designated. And thirdly, to provide a coastal environment and beach, which will be valued by both the local community and visitors alike. So on that basis, I, I support the cabinet members decision to pause the vegetative beach management of works as assented by Natural England at Hoylake Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parker, and thank you for your contribution. I'm going to open it up to members questions. Um, so I have Councillor Alan Brain first, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Dr. Parker, for that uh, very uh, uh, concise uh, report for us. Um, you, you talk about the need for uh, a pause in, in beach management. Well, as, as far as we've heard tonight, we've, we've already effectively been pausing that for the best part of two years. Uh, how, how long does that pause need to be to establish your baseline? Well, that's a, a, an interesting question because if you we've talked a lot about this vegetation tonight on the beach and we talked about grass but actually if you go there and do vegetation survey now you'll find 20 or 30 species of plants uh, growing in this zone and they're a mixture of, of salt marsh plants and uh, and increasingly dune dune vegetation so 
what we need, I, I think, is a is a this pause to give us a. I would I would say at least a couple of years of of, of evidence to see what effect does this vegetation have on, for example, the the accretion of sand. There's a lot of sand blow, as we know, at Hoy Lake. How much of that could be retained on the beach by this this new vegetation developing? And if you rake the vegetation, you start the process off every time. So what we need is two or three years, I think, to see exactly what what will happen uh, on that uh, with that vegetation and, and the, the good current development of, of I, I think, uh, sand based systems. Uh, thank you. And if I could ask one, one further question, uh, in your third point, you were saying you, you, you'd hope the beach could be used and enjoyed by the, by the community. And, and clearly we've heard a lot of people tonight saying very passionately that they want to see um, an amenity sandy beach. Uh, will, will that feature as part of the, the future of the beach as, as you see it? Yeah, two, two, two components of that, really. And I'm basing this on my knowledge of the Sefton Beach and also some beaches on, on Anglesey and in North Wales, where visitors do walk through a, a dune system before they get to a nice sandy beach beyond. So one can envisage uh, the, the sandy beach that, that everybody really wants actually being in front of uh, a potentially low sand dune communities, so new sand dunes. But that doesn't rule out that actually we could have a uh, an amenity beach that's that's similar to the one at West Kirby. There's an area at West Kirby by the Marine Lake where which is kept clear of vegetation, and uh, and that that kind of thing. And also there will be a need for the RNLI to to be able to launch its boats in, into the bay. So there there will be a need for management uh, around places like that. So I think that's there are two answers to your question there. Okay, most helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have. Um... Councillor Cox. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for your comments, Dr Parker. Um, I'd just like to start by saying, I think we're fully aware of the statutory protections around the beach. It's um, it, it, it's, it's, it's well known, particularly in the actual area itself. You said, you said you're a resident in the local area, I think. Um, it, it's, it's, it's well known, and I think there are many stakeholders from the light boats to uh, HVL, for that matter, for, for many others who are actually aware of the statutory protections, including myself. But I think what I would just say, um, and forgive me, some of what you just said is massively contradictory because the exact thing that we're suggesting, and I have suggested now to the previous speaker, who's uh, Dr. Jemmett, and to Councillor um, Gray before, was that there was a certain area of a beach that we are looking to break, right? which is the super tidal area, which no one seems to want me to talk about for some reason. But anyway, I'll continue. Um, so that would, that would constitute a piece of land um, a piece of beach that was raked for the amenity of the local people. I think you can can care. Now, you have just suggested to us that there could well be, and we may well need to, rake an area of beach which could be used for amenity. In fact, it may well actually be needed for the upkeep of the beach, for the maintenance of the rest of the beach. So, I, I don't... Okay, I'll put it this way to you. What area would you suggest would be reasonable to actually rake and in a, a, a both in a long and width uh, basis? Because I know what I consider to be reasonable, um, and what we were talking about is literally ha halfway out out to the uh, the edge of the light boats in order that they can launch, that it's not a hindrance on themselves there, and the full length of the beach. Now I don't see that as being unreasonable when. When the tide is at low tide, I'm not, uh, someone f can correct me. Uh, a friend of mine who's on the uh, uh, light boat suggested it's somewhere in the reason one one and a half to two miles out. Um, so we're not talking about an enormous. I'm not. I'm literally not suggesting that we should get a tractor and start raking from the wall out to the waterline at a uh, 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 shoreline at, at low tide. We have literally suggested an amenity area, the full length of the beach. Though. So in your opinion, what is a reasonable area that you believe would need to be or sh or could be raked and still meet the SSSI um, uh, responsibilities? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, well, firstly, the 
the SSI boundary, I believe, and the and the protected area boundaries generally are, are the, I think, are the are the sea wall. In fact, along along the uh, sorry along the Hoy Lake Prom. So, uh, if you're if you know if you're going to have a, an amenity beach that's um, that's that's actually you know you, one would have to consider taking that out out of the SSI, which would be you know it, it's possible that, that that it has been done before. Um, but in terms of um, uh, you know how how big? I really don't know the answer to that. I I think we actually this is where we do need the evidence to to determine where is the best place for such if an amenity beach is going to be created and 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 managed as we as we have at West Kirby, where indeed would be the best place for that? I don't know the answer to that. Don't have don't have the evidence, but um, I I believe it, it could be done. But um, I still go back to my uh, to my earlier answer that. Um, Actually, what is wrong with an, an amenity beach, a sandy beach in front of a, of a, of a dune system at, at Hoylake? You know, that, that's another way of looking at another possible outcome from, from all this, actually. I think that, 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 that has been suggested in, in literature that I've actually seen. The only problem with that is, is that yourself and Dr. Gemmett have literally just said before that you've no idea whether that will actually form um, in our lifetime anyway. So we could well, literally no, but... sit there with swamp for the rest of our days with no amenity beach for my residence whilst we wait for these fabled um, uh, dunes to actually form. Yeah. The, the, this is this is the problem. We're, we're talking about very short term planning here. And I think the big message from my evidence is that you're talking about uh, a piece of work that needs to be done that, that's going to accommodate change for the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, and, the, and the local, you know, Wirral Borough Council and other agencies and the local communities have to face up to the fact that the sea level is rising. We're getting more storminess. We're getting an increasing um, tendency of, because of the natural dynamics of the of the system there for beach vegetation to form you know th these all these things are happening we're looking you're asking me about short-term solutions but we have to look at that in the context of of a much larger longer term planning and uh, and planning for the future and alan mentioned about looking back in time yes we do need to look back in time but what's happened to that beach over the last you know 50 perhaps we need to look back almost that amount of time to look forward uh, as well so um, that's why we need to do these evidence-based studies, so we get really good evidence to, you know, to come up with with uh, proposals as you're suggesting that that will actually make sense, be sustainable, and uh, and deliver really what is required for that coastline, which is, you know, it is it is we're quite vulnerable really now. Our Wirral coastline, so much of it is at sea, pretty well at sea level or below. They're going to have to think very hard about, and, and the council and others, very hard about these long-term issues. And our short-term solutions are going to have to fit into the context of the long-term thinking. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Um, hands are popping up now. I've got Councillor Johnson, Cameron, and then Musprat. So, Jenny. Thank you, thank Chair. You, thank you, thank Dr. you Dr. Parker. Parker. I'm just wondering about the sand dunes. They're formed, as I understand it, by wind wind blowing at the, the sand effectively and blowing potentially against the vegetation. What is the prevailing wind? Well, the prevailing wind is is in this area is probably I have to look at the, look it up, but probably most of the prevailing wind in the UK is from the southwest. But we do get a lot of, of northwesterly winds in this part of the world following once the depression has gone through, it tends to switch from southwest to north, northwest. So a lot of the sand movement on the estuary um, and North Wirral foreshore is, is when, when we get these northwesterly winds, probably all the way around to the northeast, actually, as well. As well. And yes, any vegetation on, on a beach will slow down wind that's carrying sand and then the sand will, will drop and you've obviously, obviously I'm sure you've seen that at Hoylake Beach mm -hmm. uh, and other areas with with sand so um, so yeah so we we've got a prevailing wind uh, but um, uh, I think the most important uh, wind direction probably is is from the northerly quadrant in terms of sand movement on the beach. Thank you. Thank you Jenny. Uh, Councillor Cameron? Hi. 
Um, sorry, just to go back to you mentioned that um, the raking had to be paused in order to uh, get a baseline um, and may even you know, take two to three years uh, to do that. Um, was this advice that you gave to Councillor Gray? How was this advice given and when? Yes, well, I only went to to the one meeting of the um, uh, of the coastal advisory group, and it was actually a meeting about setting up a coastal advisory group. And there there were discussions at that meeting, and in fact, I think we we were asked to give small presentations about what we felt about the the management of the beach, um, and and really, I, I think I probably said much as what I've what I've said this evening, really, about the long term nature of what we have to do here. So. That's as far as it far as it went. So uh, there were no decisions taken there. It was a very much a, a sharing ideas and um, and also the concept of having a, a coastal advisory group. And, and sorry, when was that? Actually, it was sometime last year. Actually, I'd have to look in my diary to know exactly which, which date it was. But I, I could certainly let. Uh, I'm sure Councillor Gray would know, know which date it was. Yes, it is a question that came up earlier, but no notes were taken or anything. So thank you. No, it certainly was a date and it, I, I, I will have my own diary entry about it. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Councillor Musbrot. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr Parker. That was very, very interesting. In fact, fascinating what you were telling us. And as you were speaking, I was wondering then, when you look at the shorelines from um, even, say, from Newborough Beach in Anglesey all the way round, you've got those areas of sand dune and sand and you go up the coast and missing out the bits where we've got holiday resorts like Prestatin and those places, the, the basic coastline appears to be sand dune and sands. Talaka, which and Point of Air, which almost joins us, is very much that. So. What you're talking about is is what would have been the natural coastline, isn't it? Yeah, well, actually, most if you look at the um, at the old maps uh, uh, where most of the development of Hoy Lake uh, is now and all the way along to Mel's, actually, most of it is built on sand dunes. Um, and um, so that is the nature of that shoreline. Uh, the North Wirral coast is a is a is a is a coast of uh, sorry, coast of sand dunes historically. Um, with quite low lying land behind, but uh, the, the sand dunes were the predominant uh, uh, feature of the, of the North Wirral coast. And um, some of it's still there. Look at the Wallasey Golf Course, for example, um, and um, Liso Golf Course. Uh, you can see quite a lot of sand dunes there still. And in, in fact, the Royal Liverpool Golf Course round the, round the corner uh, is a, a whole golf course is on a sand dune system. So, yes, the you're, you're talking very much about the natural vegetation, the natural features of 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 Hoylake, and um, you know whether or not um, you know a new system could be will will eventually form in front of the uh, the, the sea wall in Hoylake is something that obviously this evidence that we've been talking about uh, will need to determine. Um, but that indeed could it may or may or may not be possible it, it, uh, because obviously the uh, the old sand dune system has now been built on in Hoylake, but um, it, the evidence suggests that um, you know that, that it could happen. And um, certainly, going to up to onto the Sefton coast, there it is a quite dynamic shoreline on the Sefton coast. And um, <coughs> but there are areas there now which are are developing <coughs> very much in the way that we think Hoylake Beach might develop. And um, so there are models that any studies that take place on Hoylake Beach could be looking at other models from other parts of the UK. Thank you and, and as you've said those dunes a lot of them have the beach in front don't they and in fact the dunes are very much used by families and, and um, people walking people walking their dogs as a shelter uh, I think of Newborough Beach exact all the way along in the summer you've got people sitting there using the dunes the base of the dunes and still having the beach so we could have the two couldn't we there's no no problem with that it's a wide stretch of beach when the tide's out indeed that that is that is one possible scenario for the future yes it, it is from what we can see the evidence that we have so far and looking at as i say in other parts of the country uh, that could indeed develop in that way yes thank you very much 
Okay, that's uh, no further questions. I can see anyone's hands are up. Uh, Dr. Parker, thank you very much for your time. It's been quite lengthy thank meeting uh, and for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move to um, the third witness of um, the decision taker. Uh, that's Miss Judy Ugona. Uh, please let me pronounce your name correctly. Are you, are you there? Yes, I am. Did I pronounce your name correctly? It's fine, don't worry. Most people can't pronounce it correctly. Oh, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> um, good, good evening, everyone. I'm just a bog standard resident, I'm afraid, after all that wonderful expert uh, witness statements. Uh, my name is Judy Ugunna, and I live at the lower end of Alderley Road in Hoylake. I've lived there for nearly 30 years. In all this time, I've been a regular user of the beach for walking, fresh air, admiring the big sky and the marvellous sunsets, and for the entertainment of children in my wider family. I want to start by stating that I find the beach to be a marvellous natural asset, and that I would like us to study and understand the ecology of our beach so that we can nurture and care for it in sustainable ways that allow both valuable bird life to flourish and the coastline to develop as far as possible as nature intends. I believe that this will result in our natural asset becoming more beautiful and more valuable over time. Speaking as someone who walks happily on the beach most days, I have observed at first hand that one of the amazing things about Hoylake Beach is its natural changeability. One day it can be soggy and muddy with interesting and varied plant life springing up along the line near the parade. Another day it can be covered over in fine sand and the beach dry and smooth as far as the eye can see. It is actually a myth that the beach was always miles of golden sands in past years. It never was in the years I've lived here. In fact, in my early years in Hoylake, the beach was often polluted in many places with oily patches and not suitable for children to play in. It is far better nowadays. I want to see a healthy, natural environment and I'm opposed to the use of toxic chemicals generally and particularly spraying on the beach. Apart from the toxicity of the chemicals, which are dangerous to children and pets in particular, nature will always spring back and it seems quite pointless and a waste of scarce public money to be spraying and or raking when the effects last only a few weeks and when this is certainly doing harm to natural processes. I support the idea to call for a proper scientific study of the beach and what is happening to our coastline. I very much want to listen to science. If there are choices and options for the future management of our coastline, they should be informed by science. But it's not just because I want a healthy natural environment. As a resident living close to the Wirral coast, I am really alarmed by predictions that the entire Wirral coastline, in particular Hoylake, will be at very serious risk of flooding by 2050. Map projections that are publicly available show a large portion of Hoylake could be underwater or at least subject to regular flooding. Global warming and the melting of the ice caps is a reality that we cannot ignore. If we understand our beach and our coastline better, we may be able to work with nature to protect our homes. I have to close, therefore, by saying that I think it would be irresponsible of our local councillors not to support the decision to have a proper scientific study of what is happening on our coastline in order to be able to mitigate the serious risks that are getting closer and closer to our horizon. And this means that I believe there should be no more interference in natural processes until scientific research has been completed. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you for your uh, time and contribution. I'm going to open it up to members' questions now. If we um, have any, I don't see any hands have gone up. I'll just give it a minute. You wild them into silence. <laughs> okay. Well, 
look, th thank you so much for, for your contribution to the committee. It is um, appreciated. I'll move on to the uh, decision taker's final witness, um, and that is a uh, Mr. Rich Adiman, um, who's also a local resident. Um, are you there, Mr. Adiman? Yes, I am. You are. We don't have to wake you up. No, no. Gosh, it's taken some time, hasn't it? <laughs> Carry okay. On. Uh, hello. My name is Rich Adiman, and I'm not an expert in anything. But what I do have is 56 years of experience about this coast from New Brighton to Hoylake. This coast faces northwest, and our prevailing winds are westerlies. As a child, I lived in Wallasey, and my father manned the Coast Guard hut on Mockbegger Wharf. He fished the beach with nets, lines, he shrimped, and he cockled. And as soon as I was old enough, I helped him. I've lived in Hoylake for the last 20 years, and my property overlooks the beach. My drains regularly block with sand, my vacuum is full of it, and my road has its own dune on occasion. I use Hoylake Beach for exercise, dog walking, bird watching, fishing, picnics, swimming, kite flying and windsurfing. It is unusual if I don't visit it twice a day. Now I love this beach, all of it, not just the first 10 metres or so from the seawall. I love the open sandscape and more recently the growth of an increasing variety of coastal plants, the so-called greening or the formation of new habitats. And last summer I watched sadly as this was destroyed with hundreds of gallons of poisons delivered by quad bikes. I watched the tractor try the same without success and I've seen the sand bulldozed away from the seawall and then I've spent months avoiding the resulting stagnant pools of water and mud. I've seen sandblocked drains and sandblocked roads. In short, I've watched a failing strategy. This natural process of increasing sand levels cannot be stopped. Sand hills will form here, on the beach, or on our roads and in our gardens. I've seen the overall level of the beach rise, and it is now drier and mud-free. Westerly winds prevail here, and the sand will blow. It will stop at barriers, be they grass, plants, dunes, garden walls, homes, cars, etc. If we leave the plants to grow, then they will catch the sand and dunes will fall and the beach profile, profile will rise. This protects us, our roads, our drains, our houses, our gardens from sand and sea. Deep water waves have power. Shallow waves have less power. Sea levels are rising and nature is offering us a solution that is elegant and beneficial to both us and the environment. The greening of the beach is a work in progress and these plants that we see are the pioneers. I'm tired of hearing how awful it is and how it will end up like Parkgate. We couldn't get this beach to look like Parkgate if we tried. This is an open coast. It's not an estuary. We have sand, a lot of sand, miles of it. And wind, there's no denying it. Orsted wind form can vouch to that. It is windy here. Anything from a southwesterly to a northeasterly will blow sand to create dunes. The whole of Hoylake is built on dunes. And as a child in Wallasey, I remember standing on a stony beach, shingle, next to the sea wall. And if I stand in that same place now, then the beach is 15 feet higher and covered in dunes. And that's a lot of sand. And it faces exactly the same direction as we do here. We can let the dunes form and keep the sand on the beach, or we can spray and rake it and watch it fill up our roads and gardens, and it will only get worse as the levels rise and the beach gets drier for longer between the tides. Spraying, raking, drain clearing and road clearing isn't free either. So even if the sand isn't in your garden or on your road, you will be paying for it. Don't get me wrong though, I loved Hoylake Beach as a golden expanse of grass-free sand. It was spectacular, but it was also a bit of a lie. There was always a lot of mud, and a really muddy area extended from about 20 metres out 
to about 200 metres out. And to get through it, you had to follow the tracks from the old lifeboat station. That's gone now. We now have clean, dry sand from wall to 10 metres. We then have grass from there to 30 metres and then clean, mud-free sand again down to the low water mark. We have Brent geese and shell duck eating the grasses in the spring. We have swallows and wagtails in the summer and bats in the evening. We have children paddling in clean tidal water that hasn't filled up with silt as it crosses all the mud that used to be there. Hoy Lake Beach is spectacular now, more so than it ever has been. And one final thing I'd like to mention is the land water flowing onto the beach. If you can just very briefly. Yeah, I will be quick. The beach. The rising beach is causing this method of disposing of land water to become problematic. The drains block and risk flooding property, but also as the beach is risen, it fails to drain away in the sand. It carries road debris, litter and silt onto the beach. It's unsightly and it doesn't sit well with any attempt to protect or conserve our environment. It's time we cleaned up our act. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I'll just wait to see if any hands go up for um, members' questions. No? Okay. Uh, well, Mr Adam, and thank you for waiting and thank you for your contribution to the committee. It's really appreciated. Um, I'll now move. Um, so I've been quite lenient, actually, with the five minutes, but I'm going to insist now if um, Councillor Garner is the, the calling signatory um, summarises key points of evidence and then um, to Councillor Gray. Andrew. Okay, thank you, Tom. Thank you, members, and thank you, witnesses. Um, what a long meeting this is, but it's really good to have the debate, isn't it? I think the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, myself and Ward colleagues, and I'm sure um, group members, uh, totally support um, research aims. Um, the issue is how do we do the research we need whilst keeping an amenity for people that otherwise are going to be very restricted uh, on amenity. Um, I think we got really uh, down into good detail with the intertidal zone and nothing that we are suggesting um, is going to interfere with the intertidal zone and I take the point of Dr Gemmett that the zone moves but it's defined I think as the mean high water to the mean low water. So there is a definite def definition of the intertidal zone. And we're not seeking to rake that, we're just seeking to rake the supratidal zone. I think that is quite clear. The whole of that area is 2% of the beach, well, less than 2% of the beach. I think the Hoyle Bank is, I forget how many thousand acres now. Um, so we're not looking to, to, to go out more than 80 metres. We're not looking to go and disturb any wildlife. We're just looking to retain that uh, amenity. Um, I'll take uh, Councillor Cook's intervention, uh, sorry, Councillor Cook's uh, comments on human intervention. Um, and yeah, you know, humans do disturb wildlife and we have got a climate emergency and we have got to do our, our best around all things. But at what point do we throw the baby out with the bathwater is, is what I'd like to say to that. Um, I think Mr Warren made a, a very clear case of the threat to wildlife from the, this action. We don't know. The original um, beach report um, is quite clear. The agreement with Natural England is quite clear um, in that report that um, if we uh, rake the beach, we keep that clear distinction between the supra and the intertidal area. And that's what the, the waders look for, that's what the wildlife looks for, that's what it recognises, that's what it wants to see to land. Um, much is made of, well, we need to let it um, uh, vegetate so we know what it's going to be. Well, bearing in mind it hasn't been raked all by one small scrape for two and a half years. If you want to see what it's going to be like in um, two and a half years if you rake it tomorrow, go and look now. I think it's quite obvious what it's going to be. Um, it just becomes a bit of a, a, a slimy mess with some plants trying to go, grow rather. Um, they invariably get ripped out by the tide. Um, I think uh, Judy from Alderley Road made a great point, and I see, I see this every week when I go down there. 
it will change. That beach will more or less do what it wants. The council's choice is whether to make it an amenity or let it just um, let it be an area that people cannot use or cannot enjoy to the full extent or the extent that people in Hoylake need. There is no other amenity. Please remember that. We have a petition of 3,000 people. I've yet to see a petition um, the other way. Uh, Hoylake has its sea defences. It has a sea wall. It's a very efficient sea wall and it takes the power out of the sea. Um, Parkgate, it gets mentioned. It gets mentioned a lot. And we're always very careful when we mention Parkgate. We don't say it's going to turn to Parkgate, but it will look not dissimilar to Parkgate. And as far as residents are concerned, it will function like Parkgate. It will not be a sandy built uh, beach. Um, Hoyt Lake was built on sand dunes. That is correct. But that area is above the uh, the tide high tide line. We get there's dunes on Hoyle Road right now. We had to get them removed. Uh, myself and Councillor Cox uh, arranged that. But it's above the tide. For the tide, for a dune to resist the tide, it's going to have to reach something like three foot high minimum. That's going to take decades because the tide will destroy as it comes in. And I take the point about the, um, the wind direction and how dunes form, but a wind that blows from the southwest will create dunes in Sefton. It won't create dunes in, uh, in Hoylake. How, how can it? And it's not that it won't try. It's not that there won't be contra forces. It's just that there won't be overwhelming contra forces. The prevailing wind, most wind, is going to the way. Okay, I want to wrap up. Okay. 30 seconds. My final word is to all councillors here. You can imagine the post box of myself, Councillor Cox and Councillor Wright. If you can imagine how your post box would be if Birkenhead Park stopped being maintained, or Puddydale and Heswell stopped being maintained, or Vale Park in Wallasey stopped being maintained, if Vicky Park in Tranmere stopped being maintained. That is our post box, that is our people, and that's what we're representing here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the summary. I'm going to now move to Councillor Gray, the decision taker, for her um, summary of evidence and key points. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check that everyone's got their microphones off? Thank you. I think it's very clear that everybody really cares about this beach. We need to work to find the best solution possible that can hopefully provide for everyone. I appreciate the variety of local views Local people and businesses just don't need to fear any changes. COVID has taught us that those businesses that wish to survive must be adaptable. Refusing to acknowledge change is actually anti-business. Insisting on an artificial barren beach is also anti-business at a time when the world is waking up to the economic opportunities of environmental awareness and sustainability. Even this Conservative government has started to listen to their advisers and the statutory bodies overseeing our natural world, who are promoting the use of nature-based solutions, and who have argued for a long time that coastlines can offer some of our best solutions to the alarming decline in biodiversity and can store carbon far more effectively than even forests. Once the drains are fixed, as I have asked for, a natural beach can also become a valuable part of our visitor economy. According to a pre-COVID report, 79 million trips were made each year to the English countryside and coast for the purpose of wildlife viewing. That is five and a half times the number that attended all Premier League games. Visitors go places for wildlife viewing and nature. Such visitors benefit from the health and well-being that has been proved to come from spending time in a biodiverse natural environment. But they also need food, drink, and often accommodation. A natural beach is nothing to be frightened of, and local businesses could benefit tremendously. A more natural beach can help us reduce our net carbon emissions and protect against the very real threat of sea level rise, extreme weather events, and the flooding this can cause. Not far from here, the coastal community of Fairbourn in Wales has been given an evacuation notice by the authorities after the evidence became clear that it is not economically viable to continue to build flood defence walls. I'm part of the local regional flood authority. 
And I can assure you that while there is increasing need for built flood defence schemes, there is unfortunately not enough money to do this. We have a duty to protect local people and businesses from flooding in every way we can. It would be an abdication of duty to reject the opportunity to allow nature to help us guard against one of the most serious threats to so many British coastal communities. We can work with nature to protect people, and we should. A resident emailed me recently to say that she was worried that a natural looking beach might affect property prices. I would like to assure that resident that nothing will impact house prices quite as much as flooding. Ask the residents of Fairbourne who can no longer sell their properties at any meaningful price. If we don't take the climate emergency seriously, then according to some evidence, we might not have much of a beach to worry about. Please vote <clears throat> to listen to the scientists and to protect Hoylake Beach. Please vote to enable an evidence-based, sensible decision regarding the future of Hoylake Beach. Please vote for the stakeholder engagement that is recommended in the decision. Please vote to enable us to plan for a beach that can be both Golden Sands amenity space for residents and contain a relatively small area of ecosystem restoration and conservation that could store carbon and protect biodiversity, that can help buffer the waves as sea levels continue to rise and can protect local residents, their properties and their businesses from flooding. Please allow this decision to go ahead so that we can gather all scientific evidence we need and engage in that dialogue with all stakeholders to find a sensible solution and pave the way for the best possible management plan for Hoylake Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray, under Gold Star, under the five minutes. Um, so I'm going to now move it out to um, debate. Um, I can see hands up already, so I'll go in order that I see them. Um, Councillor Cox and then Councillor Kenny. Tony, and then Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you. So, someone's quacking in the background, I'm sorry. I'm hearing quacking. Can you hear that? Um, uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, if I can, I, I, I don't know how much of a debate we need, to be fair, with um, four hours uh, plus a preliminary meeting before. Um, I'm happy to uh, move a resolution and go to a vote if that is uh, acceptable. Right. Um, if you just pause there, then, does any, um, uh, Councillor Kenny and Brian, do, do you want to make points contributions or do you want to move resolutions? Yeah. Yeah, Chair, I want to move a resolution, okay. please, for this item. OK, Councillor Brown. No, I didn't have a, a resolution. Hey, you go ahead. <laughs> Alan, yeah. Right, okay. OK, right, thank you. Well, obviously, I don't know what, um, I'll put my camera on. Uh, I don't know what Councillor Cox is going to propose exactly, but um, there are some areas of agreement tonight, aren't there? Um, we all agree that something needs to be done about the drains, but that is unfortunately the probably the most expensive part of the whole exercise. So that's a, a problematic one, but clearly needs addressing. I think there's widespread agreement that we don't want to see the use of uh, glyphosate to, uh, to to manage the beach. Um, and that, that consensus is to be welcomed. It does throw up a problem for me as far as the, the beach management plan gives us two weapons. One is the, the herbicide and the other is the raking. And um, if we take one of those weapons away, will the raking be sufficient on its own if we go ahead with that? I would just like to say uh, about um, Councillor Gray, I've always found her to be extremely collaborative and we've had several meetings where we've worked together on, on a, a, a raft of issues. And I, I find it a little disappointing to hear tonight that, that there's been a, a breakdown or a failure to reach out to the, the local community in Hoylake. At least that is certainly the perception from some of the people who have spoken tonight. Uh, and and I, I do feel that's uncharacteristic and, and unhelpful because I think if we're going to find a way forward, we, we do need to find uh, a, a compromise. Um, I was a bit struck by one thing that Councillor Gardner was saying in his winding up, uh, which seemed to undermine a lot of the rest of his argument. He said, that beach will do what it wants. 
Well, I mean, that rather undermines the case for, for the, this detailed management of the beach. Um, Hoylake Beach changes over the years, over the centuries. If you go back to the 19th century, Hoyle Lake was used by ocean-going vessels which were berthing there before finding a, a berth in the Liverpool docks. The, the profile of the area changes constantly, and there's a limit to what one can do in the face of nature. That said, um, I, I think that there are smaller steps we can take uh, which can um, minimise the, the impact uh, of change. Um, and I, I feel that we ought to seek out some form of compromise. I, th I think there is certainly a scope for limited raking of the beach. Perhaps we could agree to designate a certain portion and then we could have part rate, part unraked uh, as a, as a, as a um, a trial area and we could still do the research on the, the growth of the, the grasses and so forth in uh, one part and keep the other parts more as, as an amenity beach. I'm sure we can find some sort of compromise around that uh, that area but the key thing is that we do do, do reach out and, and uh, consult with the community and all elements of the community the decision, of course, you know, we're not making a decision tonight. We don't have that power. Um, it's up to Councillor Gray. But then in a few weeks, we're going to have the committee system brought in when the whole thing can, can be reviewed in any case. Um, but those are my remarks, and I wait with interest to see what uh, Councillor Cox has to uh, propose. Thanks, Alan. Um, does any other member want to come in and... Um make a contribution before I go to Councillor Cox and Kenny for their resolutions. No. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cox, you were first, so do you want to move your um, resolution? Uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know whether I should sign share this or I'll read it out first. If it's not clear, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sh try to share it with everyone. Um, the committee advises the cabinet member to rethink this decision and now engage in a true consultation with every Hoylake and Mel's, uh, Mel's resident. The organisation of this consultation to be finalised by officers and in consultation with ward members. This is to be treated as a referendum on the future of the beach, Sandy Meanity Beach, or naturalisation, grass stroke, stroke salt, mar salt marsh allowed to grow, and to inform the council on the feeling of local residents. If the outcome is, as expected, overwhelmingly in, put me season, overwhelmingly in favour of having an amenity beach, Council will make all efforts to set aside the SSSI for a reasonable area from the seawall in order to provide residents with the amenity provision they are demanding. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Is there a seconder for that resolution? Yeah, I'm uh, more than happy to uh, second that resolution. OK, thank you. Um, just uh, sorry, can I just get some legal advice? Vicky, do we vote? Do we hear Councillor Kenny's one or is it an amendment to it now or do we hear two separate resolutions? I think we need to know whether Councillor Kenny is moving an amendment or whether he wants to move a second resolution. Obviously, an amendment needs to either leave out words or insert words in the motion that Councillor Cox has moved. OK, thank you for that. Brian? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, I'm in your hands as Chair, but as far as I can see, what I'm going to move now would be a separate motion on the basis that I would wish to oppose Councillor Cox's motion and ask the committee to support the motion I'm going to move now. So, shall I read the words out at this stage, Chair, anyway? I think that'll be helpful just to see what yeah. it is. Yeah. OK. What I wanted to move, Chair, was this Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee having considered all the evidence and noting the debate today, agrees to uphold the decision taken by the relevant cabinet member in relation to Hoylake Beach Management. So that was the motion I wish to move at this stage, Chair. Thank you. Have you got a second, Councillor Cannon? I'll second that, Tony Cottier. Thank you. So, um, just going back to Vicky, I'll take Tony, Councillor Cox's uh, motion first. And yes, would you like me to read out the names, Chair? 
Yeah, so if members, um, it's a roll call, so if members can put on their microphone and camera when they're voting, that'll be helpful. All right, I beg your pardon, Chair. Which motion are we voting on first? Councillor Cox's. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Muspratt, can I ask you for your vote? Against. Councillor Cotty? Against. Councillor Collins? For. Councillor Davis? Against. Councillor Greeny? Against. Councillor Kenny? Councillor Kenny? Against. Sorry, against. <clears throat> Councillor Cox? For. Councillor Jones? Against. Councillor Williams? Against. Councillor Cameron? For. <laughs> Councillor Johnson? For. Councillor Brain? Councillor Brain? Seems to be Councillor Brain. Brain. I'll come back to him. Councillor Cook? Against. Councillor Anderson? For. And Councillor Brain? Councillor Brain, are you able to give us your vote? not on the list. Yeah, he appears to have dropped out the middle. He's just popped back up. Councillor Brame, are you able to give us your vote? Sorry, I dropped out of the meeting there. I don't know why. Uh, four. Four. Okay, thank you, members. Thank you. That's everybody. Yeah. Do we have the numbers? I make that six in favour of the motion and eight against the motion. So that means the motion is lost. OK, so we are now going to vote on Councillor Kenny's motion. Um, same again, if members can put the camera on and microphone when they're voting. Um, Vicky, over to you. Councillor Muspratt. For... Councillor Cotier. For. Councillor Collins. Against. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Greeny. For. Councillor Kenny. For. Councillor Cox. Against. Councillor Jones? For. Councillor Williams? For. For. Councillor Cameron? Against. Councillor Johnson? Against. Against. Councillor Brame? Against. Against. Councillor Cook? For. And Councillor Anderson? Against. I make that eight for the motion, Chair, and six against, which means the motion is carried.
Thank you, Vicky. Well, the mo as Vicky said, the motion is carried. May I thank every every member and every witness's perseverance tonight. I think that's a record of four hours, 20 minutes, the longest call in. Um, so I hope everyone can get some dinner. Thank you for your time. I'd like right. to thank, thank you. you very fair. Thank you. Well, Chair, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Chair.